Okay, now we're ready and we can get started. Uh, we're going to continue on heterogeneous multi-core. Uh, I motivated heterogeneity yesterday uh, in many, in multiple ways. I'm going to flash through some slides first and then, uh, well, we've discussed this yesterday also, so you know who to talk with <laughs> if you're interested in that. Uh, we're going to hopefully cover heterogeneous multi-core and bottleneck acceleration today. Uh, if we have time, we'll start uh, something else. These are some of the readings uh, that we're going to cover. And remember, we were talking about heterogeneity, asymmetry. Why do we want this? Because symmetric design is one size fits all. And it's very difficult to come up with a single design that satisfies all workloads, all parts of a workload, even for a single metric. And that satisfies all design metrics at the same time. And we've, uh, we've discussed that this holds true for different system components or resources. And we've given examples of the heterogeneity that we've built into the systems. And this is the pictorial view, if you remember. I like keeping this picture in mind whenever I think about homogeneity and heterogeneity. Homogeneous is this one, heterogeneous is this one, and it gives you choice, basically. You don't have any choice in the homogeneous version. Of course, you have some choice. It's not perfectly homogeneous, probably, because of uh, the distances that you have to different resources. You could potentially make it perfectly homogeneous also, but distance from here to here, for example, is different from distance from here to here. That's the heterogeneity that you have inside a homogeneous system. But if you look at the resources themselves, they're all the same. OK, we also talked about this yesterday, three key problems. And we've discussed that asymmetric designs can help solve these problems. Basically, heterogeneous designs can help solve these problems. And we're going to look at, especially this one in this lecture, especially efficiency in terms of performance. But performance efficiency usually translates to energy efficiency as well, as we will talk about. And this is another recap. So these heterogeneous multi-core systems already exist. Uh, the IBM cell processor was one of the earliest examples. And we have a lot of heterogeneity in the system today. Maybe not enough. Uh, but it's increasing. Uh, in the memory system, as well as the CPU, GPU, hardware accelerator, cores, or agents. So we're becoming increasingly heterogeneous. And management of this heterogeneous uh, components is becoming difficult also. Uh, that's the downside of heterogeneity, right? You have choice, you need to manage the choice. OK, so this is where we left off actually yesterday, uh, after jogging our memory very quickly uh, on what we've covered uh, in the latter, latter part of the uh, lecture yesterday. So we're going to focus on multi-core design. And uh, I'll give you an asymmetric perspective. But we're also going to focus on issues like synchronization parallel applications, scalability uh, in multi-core design uh, in this. So it's going to be, hopefully, very interesting. Basically, uh, when multi-core design started, uh, it, uh, the reason they started was because single core, building a very large single core was not easy. Uh, and it didn't buy you a lot of performance because it had a lot of complexity associated with it. If you want to scale up your out-of-order execution window size, for example, it becomes complex. It becomes not so power efficient. And people didn't develop e uh, algorithms very easily to actually make it power efficient at that time. Today, things are much more power efficient, but it's still not as easy as having a single core, simple core like this, for example, and replicating it uh, as in a tile and then connecting the cores in some way. This is an example over here. Tyler has maybe second generation processor. It has 100 very wimpy small cores that are connected together. So this is clearly a simpler design compared to a single core occupying the entire chip, and you're trying to accelerate that single thread. And it's lower power also. Uh, basically, uh, multi-cores uh, enable large-scale parallelism on chip. And these are some examples. They're relatively old. Like this says eight cores, but this picture has six cores over here. But the new generations have even more cores, actually. It's still called Intel Core i7, I think. <laughs> uh, if you. Yeah, we'll cover some of these. So, and also, clearly, GPUs have a lot more cores, although the definition of a core sometimes is very blurry. NVIDIA likes calling things that I don't like calling cores as cores. A core is something that should be able to execute uh, a single uh, independent uh, thread, I think. Uh, it's not clear if that's the case for all of the com cores that are labeled as cores in some of these GPU chips. Uh, OK, uh, any questions? So uh, clearly, this provides you a, a, a simplicity and lower power, large-scale parallelism on chip. But if you have many cores on chip, ideally, you would like n times the performance 
uh, of an application, if you have n times the cores, when you parallelize the application on the n cores, right? That's the scalable performance. As you increase the number of cores, you want to increase performance. But that's not true. What we get is bottlenecks everywhere. One of the bottlenecks is Amdahl's law. You have a serial bottleneck. You have a parallelizable portion of your program. You can parallelize it, hopefully perfectly. Uh, but the serial par portion of your code remains, and that becomes your bottleneck. The way I like thinking about it is, is I don't know if you need the lights changed, but if you can change it, that's good. You have a program, uh, you start the program, and you have some serial part, and then you have a parallel part over here. So a parallel part is nicely parallel, hopefully, and then you have some other serial part, and then you have some other parallel parts, many threads running. And in the end, your performance is bottlenecked by what fraction these serial parts constitute of your program, right? If this is 50% of your program is serial, then the maximum speed up you can get is 2x, even if you have an in infinite number of cores. It doesn't matter because you cannot parallelize this on the infinite number of cores, right? So it's very powerful, 2x, right, uh, with infinite number of cores. So you want this parallel, uh, serial part to be as small as possible. Okay, I'll figure this out someday. <laughs> okay, so that's one bottleneck that we're going to talk about and, and try to accelerate. So that serial part doesn't benefit from multi many cores, as you can see, but it could benefit from a very powerful single core because it's a single thread that's executing. Okay, but we also have bottlenecks in the parallel portion. So if you think about this parallel portion over here, I don't know how to display both at the same time, but maybe this is a good trade-off. In this parallel portion, uh, parallel portion is not also perfectly parallel. There are a lot of bottlenecks that you have over here. And we talked about some of these in the previous lectures when we talked about uh, parallel application memory scheduling, for example. Uh, and let's go back to Amdahl's law. We'll talk about the bottlenecks in the parallel portion in a little bit. Uh, basically, if you can parallelize your program, that's good. Uh, you're bottlenecked by the serial portion. So this is Amdahl's law. Basically, this is the speed up you get with n number of processors with um, f designated as your, the parallelizable fraction of your program. Basically, this 50% is f in this case. It could be 90%. And this is the number of processors. And you were assuming that the parallel portion is perfectly parallel over here. Basically, uh, you have part of the program that you cannot accelerate with n, 1 minus s. Uh, that's the serial part. Uh, and you have part of your program you can accelerate with, uh, with multiple cores, that's f, and you reduce that fraction to f divided by n because you're actually uh, dividing the work across n processors that way. That's the idea over here, right? Makes sense, right? You've seen this equation, I assume. Has anybody, everybody seen this, Amdahl's law? Okay, good. Not everybody? This is not covered in parallel programming? No? You don't remember? <laughs> Okay, but this is obvious, hopefully, right? It's clear now. Uh, basically, uh, this is the speed up you get with n cores. Uh, and how do you derive it? Basically, you look at the execution time with one core uh, and execution time with n cores, and that's the division that you have. Okay, uh, so this is good. Uh, but the uh, implication is that the maximum speed up is limited by the serial portion. If as n goes to infinity, that's how you calculate your maximum speed up, meaning as you have infinite number of cores, this goes to zero. So your speed up is bottleneck uh, becomes one divided by minus one minus f. So if 50% of your program is parallelizable, then you get a speed up of two because your f is 0 0.5 in that case. If 90% of your program is parallelizable, your f is uh, 0 0.9 over here, uh, and you get a 10x speed up in the maximum case. This is one bottleneck, so it's a very important bottleneck. This is exactly the reason why the Cray-1 machine had the fastest scalar processor of its time. It, has, it, had, the, it had a very wide SIMD unit, but it also, uh, wanted, uh, they also wanted the machine to be very fast in the scalar portion or serial portion. That's why they had the highest frequency machine of its time at that time. Because every parallel program is limited by the serial bottleneck. Okay. But if that's not enough, uh, this is not also true, right? This, this, uh, this, pick, uh, this equation makes an assumption. And the assumption is that this f 
fraction of the program is perfectly parallelizable. Meaning you have f, you can divide by n, and you get, that's the acceleration that you achieve in the parallelizable portion. That, that's, that's, uh, that's the execution time that you get by dividing by n. But that's not true because there are many bottlenecks over here. We've discussed some of these bottlenecks actually. Synchronization is one bottleneck, right? The threads are not completely independent of each other. Uh, they need to synchronize with each other. Uh, the, for example, one of them may be updating some shared data, and the other one uh, might also want to update that shared data. In that case, now you're reducing the parallelism, right? Because one thread cannot update the shared data when the other thread is updating the same data. As a result, by definition, you've, you've gotten rid of the parallelism that you have. And that part, that, that's why you don't have perfect parallelism over here. What else? There are two other things over here, actually. There are three fundamental reasons why a parallel portion is not perfectly parallel. I've given you one, synchronization. Or you can think of this also as communication overhead. Because when you're synchronizing, you're really communicating between the threads. Because one thread needs to wait for another value that's written by some other thread, right? And this happens through locks or through messages, if you have message passing. It doesn't matter what kind of parallelism model you use, you, you need to synchronize uh, between threads, unless they're completely independent of each other which is usually not the case in a, in a parallelized, multi-threaded program. Anybody wants to guess the other two? We've covered one. Actually, we've covered both. We didn't explicitly specify this as uh, something that limits parallelism. Well, we did, actually. Yes, please. Exactly. That's one of them. That's the third one over here. <laughs> so I, uh, I would call, uh, call it more generally, it's a resource contention. Basically, the threads contend for resources, and whenever one thread can access an, a resource, the other one may not be able to access the resource. As a result, you reduce your parallels, because the threads cannot completely operate in parallel. And that violates this f divided by n, n assumption. So that's resource contention. It usually happens in memory. It could also happen in the processor if you have multi-threading, for example. Uh, that's why I like calling it resource contention, because if you have multi-threading, you could share the pipeline between threads, and one thread uh, is accessing the register file, for example, or accessing some structure in the pipeline, the other thread may not be able to put instructions in. Okay, so we've got two of them. What's the third one? We've seen that one <laughs> when we talked about uh, parallel application memory scheduling. Okay, tell me more. The part of the operating system which has to schedule the different process. Mm -hmm. I wasn't thinking about that one. Uh, I mean, it could be a bottleneck, but let's assume that it, you can schedule things in parallel. Let's assume that you have threads running on the processors. What could be your bottleneck? And a, a good scheduler should not uh, become the bottleneck, I think. But that's a good point. I mean, there, there are other potential things that could limit your parallelism if you don't design them well. <laughs> so you have these threads running together uh, across different cores. They're not communicating. Synchronization already is gone. They're not contending for resources. But there's another reason why uh, this is not perfectly parallel. You cannot do this f divided by n. Yes? Exactly, yes. And that's the second one. And basically, imperfect parallelization, right? You have, this assumes that all threads are equally balanced. But if that's not the case, then you cannot do f divided by n clearly. One thread has little work, another thread has a lot of work. That thread is the bottleneck now, and you cannot do f divided by n, because one processor has a lot more load than some other processor. And this, is, this happens because of imperfect parallelization. That's one reason. It could happen because of Locality issues, for example, right? You, you, even though you may actually have, let's say you have, a, 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 I gave the example of a book with 128 pages, right? You, you may have divided the uh, 128 pages equally. In your mind, it, it, the equal number of pages corresponds to equal load for the thread. And each thread, let's say, assume you have eight threads and each thread gets 16 pages. The one thread gets 16 pages that, is, that are empty <laughs> or that are full of pictures. 
so it doesn't need to do any work. Another thread gets 16 pages. Uh, well, it depends on what the, what the work is, but the work, if you remember, is c computing the number of characters, the histogram of characters uh, that you see in a page. If it's full of pictures, there are no characters. That's the assumption. But if another thread gets uh, 16 pages that are full of characters, then it, it has a lot of work. Right? So even though you may think that you may have perfectly parallelized your program, because of the nature of the work, you may still be imperfectly parallelized. And this is very difficult to achieve. Perfect parallelization, such that every thread does equal amount of work, uh, given uh, an input set and given the same processor is not... Uh, is very difficult to achieve. And the third one we were discussed, resource sharing or resource contention overhead. Basically, you have contention. When, when you have shared resources among some number of processors, they need to contend. As a result, one needs to wait for the other uh, when the resource is not available. Then you cannot do this f divided by n. Okay. So, so these are very fundamental. And these are the reasons why you cannot do that f divided by n. Uh, and we're going to talk about these, actually, how to actually fix this problem also. These are, so you can think of these as all bottlenecks. You have the serial bottleneck, but parallel portion also has bottlenecks inside them. If you can come up with something else that's very fundamental, I'd love to know, but these are the three major things. And they're, they're really independent of each other. OK. Any, any questions? So one, one th of course, we could do more over here, but how do you, for example, change this MDAL's law that, uh, that doesn't take into account these parallel bottlenecks such that it takes into account parallel bottlenecks. MDAL's law is really a model of thinking about programs, right? It's not, there's no law in it in, the, in a sense. It's really a performance model that MDAL said, this is a good way of thinking about parallel programs, serial portion, parallel portion. And if I can perfectly parallelize my parallel portion, I'm stuck with my serial portion. And if my serial portion is too large, then I don't get a lot of benefit. From, process, uh, from parallel computing, basically. And if you read this paper, which I would encourage you to do, it's a very short paper, three-page paper, he basically looked at the serial fraction uh, for multiple programs, and he said it's about the, serial, uh, the parallel fraction is about 65 70% in these interesting programs. So we cannot really achieve very large parallelization, very large speed-ups with this sort of uh, parallel fraction. And you can see the title. It says, Validity of the Single Processor Approach to Achieving Large-Scale Computing Capabilities. So he basically said, OK, you should build single processors uh, that are very good at uh, speeding up these serial parts, which makes sense. It's still true. It's very fundamental. If you parallelize your program really well, of course, this uh, F becomes, let's say, 99%. Then you can achieve very large speed-ups. OK, the problem is you cannot parallelize uh, your program really well <laughs> in many cases. <laughs> you have serialized code sections. And the causes of serialized code sections are essentially things that uh, affect those bottlenecks that we discussed. So sequential portions are clearly one. These are MDAL serial part. Critical sections, barriers, and limiter stages in pipeline programs. Actually, we've seen all of these uh, before, but we're going to go in, uh, more into detail uh, in this. And if you have serialized code sections, they reduce performance, they limit scalability, and they also waste energy. Basically, when one thread is causing waiting for all of the threads, you're basically wasting a lot of energy. Because you may be doing something, uh, uh, basically you're not doing anything for many of the threads, and one thread is the bottleneck. Right? OK, so one example, uh, this is an old example by now actually, but uh, based on studies that we've done uh, in 2007 or so. Uh, MySQL is a, a commonly used database. And you can think of, again, uh, MySQL operating as uh, this way. Whenever you receive something, you, get, you open some database tables. You receive a query. You open some database tables that you need access to. You lock them. And then you perform the operations uh, that the query dictates on the database tables. So this part is parallel. But this part, opening the database tables, you actually you need to ensure that nobody else has those tables, especially if you're going to write to them. Uh, so you need to access some open tables cache. And this is, turns out to be it's the critical section, uh, and people optimize it. But if you don't optimize it, you run into issues. And this is an example of uh, the speed up uh, that you would get if you keep adding more threads uh, into MySQL. Uh, 
So this is, this is also, this is also called a speed up curve or a scalability curve. It's usually shown this way. The number of cores you have, implicit assumption is that you run uh, the same number of threads as the number of cores that you have. Basically, you keep parallelizing, increasing the parallelization of your program. And this is the speed up that you have compared to having only one thread or one core. Of course, at, at point one, x equals one, y is equals one. And if you keep adding more threads, you get a good speed up. But at some point, your speed up saturates and your performance starts going down. This is usually how these curves look like. So why does your performance start going down after some number of threads? Any guesses? Why doesn't it become flat? It just starts going down here, right? That sounds bad. <laughs> yes? Yes, exactly. So this, in this case, it's exactly that. So there are multiple reasons, but one of the big reasons is because you have lock contention. So one thread is holding a lock, another thread uh, wants to get that lock. You basically need to move the lock across many caches. And if you, at some point, you have too many threads and you basically ping pong the lock across many caches. And the benefit that you get from parallelization does not outweigh the cost of moving those, that lock and lost locality. And it's not just the lock, it's also the shared data. Uh, basically, it's all of the shared data that you have that moves. And you have this ping ponging effect that leads to redu uh, more, uh, too much communication. And when that communication outweighs the, when I say communication, it's the same as the synchronization overhead over here. Yeah, when that synchronization overhead outweighs uh, the benefit of parallelization, then you, lo you start losing performance. That's one reason, right? But it could be other reasons also. You could, have, you could start getting resource contention, for example. You could start getting too many robo for conflicts. That's another potential reason. Uh, but OK. So basically, today, the maximum speed up that you can achieve with some sort of system, today meaning 2007, in this case, for this particular example. But there are many curves that you will see like this. That's true for many ap applications. You have a maximum point uh, of parallelization that you reach. Uh, and this is the maximum number of threads uh, to run this application with. So it's, I don't know, it's 18 over here, I guess. At 18 threads, your performance saturates. And that's the, your application is scalable up to 18 threads in, on this system. OK. And it's bottlenecked by this critical section, as we will see uh, later on also. So wouldn't it be nice if you had a curve like this? And we're going to talk about techniques to achieve uh, a curve that looks like this. And this curve is much better, as you can see. Your parallelization uh, point, uh, the scalability point, the saturation point goes up to 34 or so. So basically, asymmetric systems can get you to this curve, and we will discuss that. OK, so basically, uh, we have different demands in different code sections, right? Code sections uh, that are serial don't benefit from these parallel uh, cores. As a result, you really need a one powerful large core for these serial uh, single thread uh, portions. But in a parallel so section, you can parallelize these really well. That's the assumption. You may get away with many wimpy small cores. Wimpy meaning very simple, right? You don't need this complicated out of order execution core that has a lot of complexity. In a parallel code section, if you really parallelize it nicely, you can get away with many small cores. But these two conflict with each other. If you have a single powerful core, you cannot have many cores because that it occupies a chip area. And, and a small core is much more energy and area efficient than a large core. Right. So you have a conflict here. So this is an example. Uh, you have large cores versus small cores. Because there are many techniques that are employed in large cores uh, that are true in today's designs. Uh, and you want maybe even larger cores, actually, to if, you, if your serial bottlenecks are a problem. And I believe that it's really important to actually look at how to design these large cores even better and even more efficiently, because we will never get rid of these serial bottlenecks in our programs and the other bottlenecks that we have in the parallel portion. So you really need to have some of your chip area dedicated uh, to these large cores. Small cores, on the other hand, maybe it, they don't employ out-of-order execution, for example. Uh, they, don't, uh, they have narrow fetch engines. Maybe they have a very shallow pipeline. Maybe they don't even have branch predictors, right, if you have perfect parallelization. Maybe they use the fine-grained multi-threading uh, such that uh, you don't need to predict branches, right? But you actually cycle through different threads every cycle. And few functional units, very simple pipelines. Uh, 
very not so powerful, right? So this is just an example of large versus small. But of course, as we discussed, asymmetry, heterogeneity, if you want to incorporate into a system, you, you may you have many choices in terms of how you design asymmetry into the system. So large cores are power inefficient. This is a rule of thumb that somebody came up with. Somebody is going to be in the next uh, slide, I think. Uh, basically, you could think of this. Uh, you get 2x performance for 4x the area or power. Uh, so it's not, uh, you don't get 4x performance for 4x area. <laughs> It'd be nice. So this is an example over here. This is actually one of the earlier papers that looked at this asymmetry. Uh, they wanted to get best of both latency and throughput, uh, which is essentially what we're kind of discussing, right? If you actually are, if you, th you can think of it this way also. If you're in the serial code portion, you're very much bottlenecked by your, your latency, how fast you can get through the serial portion. And if you're in this parallel portion, you're very much bottlenecked by your execution throughput, how much you can actually push through with all of the threads and uh, get to the end of the parallel portion. Right? So you really want best of both latency and throughput in a system that looks like this. And this paper examines uh, some choices. So they basically look at, uh, this is a paper from Intel. Uh, and I will have, yeah, I have it somewhere. I don't, not here, but um, basically they look at uh, a large core microarchitecture that they uh, don't de describe in detail, but Intel has been building a lot of large core microarchitectures. Uh, this is kind of similar to the Pentium 4 at the time. You have a uh, large width, large pipeline depth, uh, large out of order, and they claim that uh, compared to the small core in order, not very wide, one instruction wide, five stage pipeline. But if you look at the performance, they claim that this is five to eight X. Take that with a grain of salt. <laughs> Uh, that could be true, but power is very large. Uh, so normalized energy per instruction is much higher for the large core. We ba basically, for a single instruction, you expend a lot more energy when you use a large core compared to a small core. Make sense? <laughs> but if you want to actually get through this serial code, you want to enable that large core. And you can actually perhaps expend a lot of energy per instruction here because... You don't have many threads, right? You don't have too many instructions to execute compared to here. So if your energy per instruction budget is constant, you would like to perhaps use it, or if your power budget is constant, you would like to increase your energy per instruction over here such that you can get through this serial code faster. If your power budget is constant, you would like to minimize your energy per instruction over here and get through, uh, maximize your throughput, instruction throughput because you have many instructions over here. That's another way of thinking about it, right? You have a maximum power budget, energy per instruction over here with a large core is large, but you can use it over here because you don't have many instructions to execute. But here, you have many, many instructions to execute because there are many threads in the parallel portion. So you don't want to actually use a very high energy per instruction because you cannot execute as many instructions if you use a very high energy per instruction core. So you actually use a small energy per instruction core to improve your throughput, instruction throughput in that parallel portion. That's another way of thinking about it. It's, this, it's really the same thing. We will get back to this also. Okay, so let's talk about the multi-core design in its early days. Uh, basically, people really didn't fully have this insight uh, before. So people were designing really more symmetric multi-core. And a lot of the multi-cores still today are relatively symmetric, but uh, they're increasing in their asymmetry. So this is one of the earliest multi-cores, actually, IBM Power 4. Uh, it looks like this. It's a symmetric multi-core chip. It has two very powerful cores, and a very powerful looks like this. And this is a beautiful paper that describes the microarchitecture. Unfortunately, people uh, are not putting a lot of papers uh, out in terms of existing core microarchitectures today. In the past, it was nice. IBM Journal of Research and Development was a very good one, actually. So this is... Uh, what the core looks like. You have two cores, out of order execution, pretty large instruction windows for its time, uh, about 100 entry, eight wide fetch, execute each year, it's a pretty wide engine, and that's sophisticated branch prediction and a pretty strong memory hierarchy, basically. So it's a very powerful core. And later, IBM uh, moved into more multi threading. So this is IBM Power 5. It is very similar, but they added multi threading to it. Basically, they could have simultaneous multi-threading. You could have two threads per core in this case. And you basically see uh, two program counters, as you see over here. Uh, 
to instruction buffers for different threads, to return address tags for different threads, and to uh, store queues for different threads, and to reorder buffers. IBM calls it the group completion tables uh, for the two different threads. So they wanted to increase parallelism that you have in the chip, so they added uh, multi-threading, as you can see. So let's talk, those, those are the big cores, and we can talk about the big cores also. Clearly, Intel has a lot of big cores also, and they were designing the multi-core chips. This is the small version. So if you look at small, uh, this is Sun Niagara. It's also one of the earlier multi-core chips. Uh, it essentially has uh, eight small cores over here, uh, and the, each core looks like this. Basically, it's very simple. It has six stages. It's a dual-issue in order machine, and it's fine-grained multi-threaded, meaning you don't need branch prediction over here. Basically, uh, oh, I don't have that, but... Uh, every cycle you fetch from a different thread, and uh, by the time you uh, execute a branch, you don't fetch from that thread. Meaning that by the time you fetch from the thread that has a branch in the pipeline, uh, that branch is already resolved. <laughs> okay. And if you look over here, it's very simple. Uh, the, the, the biggest complexity is added by multi-threading, basically. You need to double everything. Uh, in this case, you have four threads. Uh, meaning you need to uh, quadruple uh, everything, multiply the instruction buffer by four. You need to figure out which thread you're fetching from, multiply the register file by four. But everything else is very simple. It's a very simple pipeline. And it even has a shared floating point unit among cores. Uh, they actually decided this was a bad idea in the later generation because floating point unit becomes a bottleneck. If you have eight cores and you're doing a lot of floating point, it's not just eight cores actually, it's eight times four, 32 threads on the chip and floating, if you have one floating point unit, that's not good. So they actually fixed that later on. So uh, remember the demands, what we want. Uh, so neither of these types of cores meet the requirements that we want. In a serialized code section, we really want a single powerful large core. If you have a single thread, you have no choice. In a parallel code section, you want many wimpy small cores, and they conflict with each other. So the key question that we're going to ask and try to answer is, can we get the best of both worlds? So let's do some performance analysis, very simple. Uh, let's assume that small core takes an area budget of one and has a performance of one, and a large core takes an area budget of four and has a performance of two. This is a simple, simplistic performance model that I mentioned. So this is the tile large approach. Basically, you have large cores and you tile them, and you can only tile a few of them because you have a limited area and power budget. And this was uh, the approach that was followed by some industry at the time. Uh, the benefit you get over here is you get high performance on single thread uh, and serial code sections. If you have a serial code section, it, sounds, uh, it runs on the large core and it basically, uh, um, you, you get two units of performance because remember, large core takes an area budget of four and has performance of two. The performance that you get is two units. But if you have a parallel program, you have low throughput on the parallel program portions because in each of them, you can run two, 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 two. You get eight units of performance. Right? That's the downside. With a large core, you don't get very high performance on the parallel program. Of course, you can think, you can say, "Oh, okay, I can, multi I can add multi-threading to it." Yes, that's true. If you add multi-threading to it, you can increase it. So there's there's a gray area here that we're not going to talk about uh, for now. In fact, there are really interesting approaches where people try to construct a large cores from small cores, like the morph core that uh, we're not going to cover here, but uh, you could actually try to uh, get the benefit of both heterogeneity and homogeneity at the same time. Uh, okay, so this is a small core approach. Uh, basically, the idea is to tile many small cores like this, uh, and this, this is the approach that's taken by Sun Niagara, for example, that I showed you. Tiler a tile that's ultra small, very small, even, even smaller than the Sun Niagara cores, and Intel Larrabee, which didn't see the uh, light of day. Uh, that was also designed to be very these, uh, these very wimpy small cores that would do powerful graphics, uh, and that didn't work out very well. Uh, it, it then later turned into these Knight's nice Landing uh, processors. So I guess if you have an updated slide, you, it would say Knight's nice Landing or Knight's nice Corner, which are really simple cores, uh, although they're not as simple as they used to be. So the big upside over here is you get uh, 16 units of performance because you have 16 cores, each of, each of them having one unit of performance right? in the through, uh, parallel part. Uh, 
But in the serial part, your performance is less than this one. Here you have two units of performance. Here, serial part runs on a single small core, so you have one unit of performance only. That doesn't sound good, right? Meaning that if you, are, if you have an application that's single-threaded, and if you had a single large core, let's assume this size, you used to have 2x performance if you move to this sort of core. So nobody wants to lose performance going from large core to small core. So that's why the small core approach didn't work out well in the general purpose domain. It's very hard to get performance in the serial uh, part of the code unless you parallelize everything. And then you get, got rid of the serial part of the code, right, clearly. But that's not easy in many applications. So if you look at general purpose systems that are commercial today, like systems from Intel, AMD, IBM, they, they haven't taken this approach. They have taken this approach so that they don't lose performance. But this approach is not really good for parallelism perfectly, right? Okay, so uh, we've already discussed this, right? Tile large is good for serial parts, uh, but not good for parallel part. Uh, tile small is good for parallel part, but not good for serial part. And it has another disadvantage. You get reduced single thread performance compared to existing single thread processors, which we know how to build large cores for. So the idea is to have both, basically. Uh, because neither of them satisfies the requirements that we want. You combine both, have both large and small on the same chip, which leads to performance asymmetry. And that's the idea of asymmetric multi-core systems. And it looks like this, basically. Uh, assume that there's no multi-threading here. Uh, basically, you have one large core, and you have 12 small cores. Uh, if you have this, you can accelerate the CL part using the large core. You have two units of performance over here. And you can accelerate the, execute the parallel part on small cores and the large core for high throughput. Basically, if you don't have multi-threading, you have 12 units of performance here, plus the two units that you get from the large core. So you get about 14, which is not bad. Right. So this is assuming that uh, you're accelerating the serial bottlenecks on the large core. If you have single thread, if you have a pro program part that looks like this, you, you, you execute on the large core. So this is a single thread portion that executes on the large core. You get to the parallel part, you execute the parallel part on the small cores, and then you keep executing them. And then when you get to another single thread, you go back to the large core. Basically, if you have only a single thread, you always execute on the large core. That's the idea. That's how you can accelerate Amdahl serial bottleneck. So if you do the performance analysis that I've done in the previous slides, this is what you get. Again, assuming no multi-threading. Uh, tile large uh, gets you this. It's not good at parallel throughput. Tile small gets you that. It's not good at serial performance. Uh, tile large and small asymmetric gets you as good serial performance as the tile large and almost as good parallel performance as tile small. Not as good, almost as good. And if you can multi-thread on top of this, now if you think about adding multi-threading over here, then that's good. Large core is multi-threaded. You can get hopefully close to 16 over here, right? But I don't want to open that can of worms right now because that opens up other kinds of designs as well. Uh, you could also multi-thread these large cores, right? Uh, and that may not be a bad approach, except uh, the power efficiency over here uh, doesn't look good. This looks at area budget only. If you have many, many large cores, and if you multi-thread all of them, the power efficiency of that may not be as high as the power efficiency of this one. So there are a lot of trade-offs here that I'm kind of glossing over and to focus on the concept of heterogeneity. Okay. Okay, so let's modify Amdahl's law to take into account this asymmetric multiprocessor. So uh, this is simplified Amdahl's law, st still simplified. Basically, we're assuming that serial portions execute on the large core, parallel portions execute on both small cores and the large cores, and F is still the parallelizable portion. L is the number of large processors, S is the number of small processors, and X is the speed up of a large processor over a small one. Now Amdahl's law looks like this. It's heterogeneous Amdahl's law. Uh, because you have X number of, uh, basically X is the speed up of a large processor over a small one, when you, uh, you're, you can actually accelerate your uh, mm, serial fraction uh, if you keep making your large core more powerful, right, by x. And your parallel fraction is divided by uh, s, number of small processors, plus x times l, number of large processors that you provide, uh, times uh, the speed up that you get on the large processors. 
And we've done it before. For example, X was two in our case earlier, uh, and we had one large processor. So uh, we, we, we sped up the, and we had 12 small processors, so we sped up the parallel pra fraction by 14 compared to having one small core. So all of this is uh, compared to having a, sm a single small core, sp speed up over a single small core. Make sense? That's very simple, straightforward. Now you can plug in, of course, uh, many things. I'm not going to go into this, but uh, you can plug in uh, for different uh, values of these. You generate different curves for different area budgets. But of course, uh, this is still not taking into account the bottlenecks in the parallel portion, right? Okay, maybe, maybe you're assuming that X is constant. That's okay. Even though X is not constant also, right? It depends on the application, probably what speed up you're getting on a large processor over a small processor. But this uh, is not definitely taking into account uh, the bottlenecks in the parallel portion. Okay, so we just modified Amazon's law for heterogeneity. We didn't modify it for bottlenecks in the parallel portion. But the good thing is, now as you increase the power of your large core, you can reduce the serial effect of your serial fraction on performance compared to a small core. We didn't have this term before over here. Okay, any questions? Now this gives you freedom, right? You can optimize both for the serial part as well as the parallel part. And even the equation looks heterogeneous right now, right? Okay, uh, so basically we haven't tackled this part. Uh, and we're going to talk about that next. How do we accelerate? Okay, we accelerate the serial bottleneck using uh, large core. And large core design is still important because of that reason. But how do we accelerate parallel bottlenecks? Uh, uh, and uh, the realization is that serialized or imbalanced execution in the parallel portion can also benefit from this large core. So if for some reason one thread over here is more important, more critical than some other thread, maybe we execute it on the large core. That's the idea. And examples could be critical sections that are contended. If a thread is holding a lock that's contended, it's making many other threads wait, maybe you should execute it on the large core, execute it somewhere else, such that it can make fast progress compared to its own core. We already saw this idea that in the context of memory scheduling. Right? If a thread is making other threads wait because it's holding a lock, maybe you should prioritize it in the memory system. Ideally, you would like to prioritize it everywhere, perhaps. But if you don't have a powerful enough core, this thread is not going to make a lot of progress uh, to begin with. Uh, or, or parallel stages that take longer than others to execute. Again, those are uh, examples that could benefit from a large core, and we will see that. So the key idea that we're going to look into is to Id dynamically, ideally, we'd like to dynamically identify these cost portions that cause serialization in general, and ship them, execute them on a large core. And maybe you can even customize the large core to actually execute these really efficiently if you really understand these different uh, codes and what they do. So this, it's really about heterogeneity and specialization. We're not going to specialize as much. We're going to assume the large core is a beefy core, but you can think of specializing that large core for critical section execution, for example, or for parallel stages or barrier execution, different things. So we're going to talk about this idea first, which is the idea of accelerated critical sections. I, basic, I gave you the basic idea yesterday, actually. You can think of having a large core that serves as a server of critical sections uh, for many clients, client, where clients are uh, small cores that request execution of the critical sections on this uh, server. Let's first take a look at why this is important. So we're going to assume some things. We're going to assume that uh, somebody has written a program that takes 12 iterations to execute, and 33% of the instructions are inside the critical sections. And these are the iterations over here uh, in terms of, uh, yeah. Uh, so basically, if you have a single processor, its execution looks like this. Assume that a single iteration takes a single time unit over here. It takes about 12 time units over here in a single processor. And critical section in this case doesn't matter, even though I uh, put it in red because... Nobody's contending with that critical section, right? If you parallelize this program and execute with two threads, the execution looks like this. Basically, you parallelize it. The threads are running mostly in parallel, except when one is in the critical section and the other needs to be in the critical section. So uh, critical sections uh, cannot be parallelized, but you don't need to be in the critical section at the same time here. It's, it looks like. It turns out, right? Basically, you overlap the critical section execution latency with... Uh, 
the, the parallel part in the other thread, except for the first one over here. So you almost perfectly parallelize this one. You almost go to 6 from 12. That's good. OK, let's go to three uh, cores, three threads. Again, you get benefit from parallelization, but not as much at this point, because now your critical sections, uh, for example, you cannot parallelize this part over here, and you lost more performance, because you need to wait uh, over here. So uh, parallelization benefits over here. Now let's say we go to four cores over here. Now we didn't get any benefit. Right. We didn't get any benefit because if you look at the three core version or three thread version of this program, at any given point in time, there is at least one thread, well, there is one thread in the critical section. Which means that if you add one more thread, there is no, nothing to parallelize. You just add more weighting. In fact, the picture is actually worse than this. This picture doesn't take into account the shared data and lock contention. It's expected to be over here because, uh, because of the communication latency that you add because of the shared data and locks, you wait even longer. And some of these parts actually become even longer. So basically, you reach a scalability bottleneck over here because your program cannot be parallelized further because you're limited by your critical sections. Your throughput is limited by critical sections at this point. So when you get to a point where at least one, uh, where there's one thread that's in the critical section at any given point in time, you don't get benefit from parallelization and you lose performance. That doesn't look good, right? So basically, this thread's scalability on this architecture is limited to three. Uh, uh, this pro program scalability is limited to three threads. But let's assume magically you accelerate the critical sections by 2x. Let's take a look at what the curve looks like now. So you gain some benefit even in the single-threaded version because you're magically accelerating these critical sections, that portion of the program that used to be read. And you gain some benefits when you run it with two threads. And you gain some benefit when you run it with three threads. You keep going. Now we gain benefit when we actually are running with four threads. Because if you look at the three-thread version over here, there's still, yeah, you, there's still some ways to go. You can add one more thread over here. And you can still parallelize the program because in this version, uh, there are parts of the execution where there are no threads that are in the critical section at any given point in time. Right? So you get, you get benefit from parallelizing even more. So if you actually reduce the size of your critical sections, you improve performance, you improve scalability as well. And you also improve energy efficiency. But we're not looking at energy efficiency over here. OK, so that's the idea. Contention for critical sections is not good. But if you have a mechanism that can quickly get you out of the critical sections, uh, you can actually improve performance significantly. OK, um, and we've discussed this also. Contention for critical sections actually increases with the number of threads and limits scalability. And we've seen this curve. Uh, we, we've discussed the reasons for it, uh, because it's, uh, you actually lose performance after some point. OK, so asymmetric designs can actually do better. Uh, so basically, we're going to talk about asymmetric designs, but there are other ways of thinking about it. You have execution time sequential kernels, which is the MDAL serial part. Critical sections and limiter stages must be short. You can say, OK, I don't really care about this. <laughs> the programmer, this is the programmer's job, right? There's a classic programmer microarchitect trade off again that we've been seeing, right? You can say, I don't want to provide virtual memory. It's the programmer's job to manage data movement from disk, code movement from disk uh, into the memory. It's the same thing, basically. It's difficult for the programmer to shorten these serialized sections, actually, because they may not know the program really well, first of all. There's variation in hardware platforms, because they may optimize it for this hardware platform, but you may actually get different behavior in some other hardware platform. You clearly have limited resources, meaning that programmer's time is expensive. If you actually, uh, uh, if they spend a lot of time optimizing the program, they may not be ha have time to add features into the program, right? And also, there's a huge performance debugging trade-off, actually. Whenever you want to optimize your program, you really want to reduce the size of your critical sections. Right? Now, if you re reduce the size of your critical sections too much, you may give up correctness. You say, OK, I'm going to reduce it. And then you leave out some variable that actually needs to be protected in the critical section. Too bad. That leads to a pro uh, bug that may, not, that may be extremely hard to find. Right? That's why if you leave this to the programmer such that, and push them to just uh, 
minimize the size of the critical sections. First of all, there is a minimal size of critical section that you can get to, probably. Uh, but getting there actually costs you not only time, uh, but also potentially correctness of your program. So it's good to have hardware support for these cases where things are difficult to optimize. For example, MySQL is a good example because database companies suffer from this a lot. Uh, Oracle, for example, optimizes their database such that this lock contention is minimized. They do pretty much uh, a lot of tricks uh, to minimize the locking overhead, minimize the critical sections, but they actually have an army of programmers doing that, expert programs. I, mean, I shouldn't say an army, but... Uh, maybe very well-trained programmers, very, they have very good domain knowledge about the program. Uh, they know their hardware platforms really well, and they're dedicated to do this. And they've been doing this for decades. <laughs> so they have a lot of experience. That's why they can actually try to reduce it. But even they want to have transactional memory inside their systems. Actually, Oracle was the first company that added transactional memory to their hardware in the SunRock processor. What does transactional memory do? Transactional memory says, okay, the programmer doesn't need to code in critical sections. The programmer just needs to say, this is a transaction. Begin transaction, end transaction, and that transaction is supposed to execute at atomically. And the hardware takes care of the rest. Hardware executes that transaction internally to ensure atomicity. So even a company that puts a lot of resources to reducing the critical sections, wants something like transactional memory because that improves their uh, productivity. Uh, also, transactional memory has other benefits in terms of improving performance, but we won't get into that. I wish we had more time so that we could cover transactional memory too. But, uh, but my point is, basically, this is not easy to do. So you cannot punt on the programmer uh, to do this. So it's good to have a mechanism that can shorten these serial bottlenecks as much as possible without requiring programmer effort, or while requiring minimal programmer effort. Uh, and clearly, the programmer effort to uh, actually minimize the critical sections, minimize these serial parts, is not easy. It's essentially parallel programming, but parallel programming to, taken to the extreme, because it's not about parallelization only, it's about very, very high performance. OK, so the idea, as we've discussed earlier, to accelerate the serialized code sections by shipping them to powerful cores in an asymmetric multi-core engine. So we're going to look at how to do that, at least one way of doing that. Uh, there could be other ways of doing it as well. So this is an example, uh, accelerated critical sections. The idea is to do its hardware-software cooperatively. Hardware and software together ship critical sections to a large, powerful core in an asymmetric multi-core architecture. So the benefits you get is you reduce serialization due to contended locks. You reduce the performance impact of these hard-to-parallelize sections. And the programmer doesn't need to heavily optimize parallel code. You may have fewer bugs, improved productivity, because hardware is doing this underneath. That's the hope. Of course, if you have a good program, you will always do better. But it, it does come at an expense. So let's take a look at how to, how to do this. Basically, we're going to design that something that looks like this. You have an asymmetric core. Uh, and you have these. You can think of this, again, as a server for critical sections and clients that request a server to execute critical sections. Uh, and we're going to add uh, a request queue, basically, critical section request buffer. The server needs to receive the requests. Uh, and whenever a client reaches this uh, enter critical section, so uh, the programmer, a lot of programmers today program with libraries uh, when they code critical sections. So it's good to use libraries. OpenMP, for example, provides you libraries uh, to use critical sections. But you don't have to use libraries, of course. If you have critical sections that are not very well delineated, you're just using instructions, uh, then it may not be easy to identify these sections. So there could be a way of automatically identifying what is, what is a critical section. But if, you, if the programmer actually programs with these libraries that clearly delineate this is the beginning of the critical section and this is the end of the critical section, what I'm going to describe is going to be a lot easier to do. If the programmer doesn't do that, there's no clean cut that says, OK, this is the beginning of the critical section, this is the end of the critical section. They don't do that. They do a lot of tricks to get the lock, for example, with load and store instructions, then you can potentially recognize patterns that look like critical sections. And I'm not going to go through that in detail, but you can think, imagine mechanisms, oh, this, this kind of code pattern looks like this process, this, uh, this code is trying to acquire a lock. And if you recognize that pattern, then you ship the critical section to uh, this core. That's, that's a way of doing it without requiring these enter critical section and leave critical section calls. But if you have this, if you're programmed nicely uh, with libraries, uh, 
And actually, a lot of programmers program nicely because they don't want to deal with that low level of code underneath. Uh, only the ones who really want to optimize their program uh, want to deal with that low level of code. And part of the benefit of this mechanism is you're catering to uh, the masses of the programmers who don't want to deal with the low level of code. OK, so let's assume you have this code. Uh, well, we've already said that. Basically, let's assume that P2, process, uh, processor 2, enter, enters a, and comes a critical section uh, with the CS call instruction. So we're going to actually add instructions to the ISA, the critical section call instruction. It sends the critical call uh, request to the uh, critical section request buffer to the server. Server queues it, and it's a FIFO queue. It executes the critical sections in order. And then it executes the critical section when this becomes the oldest in the machine. Uh, well, when, it, uh, when, when, the, when the processor is ready to execute, and when this is the oldest, it basically takes it out of the queue, executes the critical section, and when it's done, it sends the critical section down signal. That's nice, right? That's the idea, basically. So how does this look in terms of code? Uh, the small core does some computation. It uh, has X, and a, a, it computes A, and it's a critical section. Basically, a critical section does this in this case. It does a critical section call to this function, and it computes a result, and then the small core prints the result. So let's take a look at how this executes in an accelerated critical section engine. Uh, basically, the small core and the large core communicate via memory. And this is one way of doing it. You could optimize uh, this a lot also by doing, adding more hardware support. Basically, small core pushes uh, the, uh, uh, the data, the input data to the critical section on the stack that's shared between the small core and the large core and basically initiates a critical section call instruction for this particular critical section X, uh, saying, uh, <clears throat> giving the target PC. This is the target PC where the uh, critical section should be executed. And this gets translated into an interconnect request uh, to the large core. You send X, the critical section ID, the target program counter, the stack pointer where you pushed, uh, and the core ID, basically a small core ID that requests the client ID, essentially. And when the server receives this request, it queues it in the critical section request buffer. And when it's ready to execute it, what it does is it basically acquires X. It still acquires the lock to ensure that there are no correctness problems in the code. Because if you don't acquire the lock, you may actually lead to correctness problems because the code is written uh, with something in mind, right? Uh, maybe, yeah. And then it pops uh, the argument from the stack. And then it executes the critical section. Uh, Basically, where it starts is target program counter. That's, that's, that's the code that needs to be executed to get the equivalent functionality for this. And then once it's done with the result, it pushes the result on the stack, it releases the lock, and basically executes a critical section return instruction. And critical section return instruction initiates a critical section done response to core ID that initiated the request. And the small core can pop the result and print the result after that. So that's the idea over here, basically. Large core executes all the critical sections. Uh, it's the server for the critical sections. And small cores are the clients for the critical sections. You can think of this as, essentially, it's basically, you can think of this as a remote uh, procedure call, right? You're invoking a remote function call on the large core. Uh, yeah. Any questions? OK, so this requires clearly changes to the ISA in this case. But you can think of potential ways of doing this without changes to the ISA, right, underneath. That requires a lot more hardware, of course. You basically figure out all of this uh, by yourself uh, in the hardware. But if the compiler does this, then it's a lot easier, right? The compiler emits these instructions. This is what is executed in the small core and the large core. And it's easier. But you could generate, you should imagine a mechanism that translates this directly into code that looks like this. OK, so one issue with this, what, we, what we've just discussed, is now the server, critical section server, is a shared resource. Right? Now, if this is a shared resource and the critical sections, you have multiple critical sections that are independent of each other, now they contend in the shared resource, which is very similar to the problems that we've been discussing in interference. right? Shared resource, there's interference across the shared resource. If two cores are executing different critical sections, now those critical sections need to execute in, uh, serially uh, in, in, in the large core. Basically, there's a problem with this mechanism, which, means that it, which is that it can serialize independent critical sections. So we're going to fix that problem uh, with a hack. <laughs> there could be other fixes. Uh, 
You could have multiple large cores, for example, and you could divert the critical sections that are independent to different large cores. Each critical section is dedicated, uh, unique critical sections are dedicated to uh, map to different large cores, basically. Uh, let's take a look at it. Let's, let's assume that you have uh, uh, this critical section called uh, A and B. And let's assume that uh, you receive these critical section called A from one of the processors. And now we have actually, uh, we're going to keep track of uh, uh, how, how much each critical section incurred false serialization. What does false serialization mean? False serialization is the fact that you caused waiting to this critical section because you're executing them on the large core. Because some other critical section is executing on the large core, you cannot execute this critical section. Now, this is false because these critical sections really should execute in parallel. And if you, ha if you didn't ship them to the large core, they would have executed in parallel, right? Because these are completely different critical sections. You're, they're operating on completely different sets of shared data. That's why they're different critical sections, right? So basically, we're going to keep track of this false serialization with counters. This basically says how many times uh, this uh, critical section called A was serialized falsely, how many times this critical section called B was serialized falsely, basically treated unfairly, let's say. Uh, and when you actually schedule critical section called A, you reduce the counter. When you actually cause false serialization, uh, you increment the counter for the critical section that's actually uh, affected. Let's say you have another critical section called A. You reduce it again. It's OK to serialize these. Actually, you do want to serialize these, right? Because they're to the same critical section called They're supposed to be serialized. And if you get critical section called B, now you have a problem. You increment it because critical section called B should normally execute. But it cannot execute because critical section called A's are in front of it. So you increment the counter, decrement the counter, uh, manage these counters. And if you actually uh, find out that uh, the counter is too large, you basically tell those small core, don't send me the critical sections anymore <laughs> for a while. That's the idea. Basically, uh, you check, keep track of false serialization and you prohibit the small core, or you send back the critical section to the small core and say, OK, don't send me critical sections for a while because I cannot execute your critical sections well. Of course, other solutions to the problem could be multi-threading the large core. You could multi-thread the large core such that multiple different critical sections can execute in parallel. That has some benefit, but that has a, that's a trade-off now. Because multi-threading reduces the performance of each of the critical sections that are executing because of resource contention in the large core. A better solution, I think, is having multiple large cores to serve as a critical section. Uh, uh, and we will see that solution later on, actually, when we talk about bottleneck acceleration. So uh, what are the performance trade-offs in accelerated critical sections? There are pluses and minuses, like every other idea. right? So you clearly get faster critical section execution. This is obvious. Uh, and that was the reason we wanted to do this. Uh, you get another benefit that we discussed in the last lecture. Now this large core hopefully has a large cache. Shared locks stay only there. So you get better lock locality. You, you got rid of the lock ping-ponging. All of the locks stay there, assuming you ship all the critical sections to the large core. And you don't need to move the locks. That's the beauty of having a server dedicated to a particular lock and particular set of shared data. Shared data also stays in large cores, hopefully large caches. You get better shared data locality, less ping-ponging. So in the ideal case, you execute all of the critical sections in multiple large cores, let's say, and divide the different critical sections to the different large cores. It looks beautiful, right? You improve both locality and you reduced the serialization. Of course, this comes with a trade-off. Now your large core is dedicated for critical sections. You, re you have reduced parallel throughput. You could relax this a little bit. I'm not going to talk into that because talk about that uh, because uh, the performance results assume that large core is dedicated, and it's nice to have a dedicated core, of course, because if you're executing the parallel portion of the program in the large core, you actually kick out some of the uh, th some of these benefits get lost, uh, get reduced if you don't dedicate the large core uh, to serial uh, critical sections. But once you dedicate, this a minus. Uh, OK, uh, you have this overhead. Uh, you shared the shared lock. Uh, basically, you've transformed the shared lock and shared data ping-ponging overhead to critical section call and critical section done control transfer overhead. Basically, you need to send stuff to the large core to initiate critical section call execution. And the large core needs to send the result back and critical section done back to. There's some overhead in starting and finishing the critical section uh, 
we've got rid of some of the overhead if it's shared data ping-ponging, but we introduced some other overhead over here. But this is not as high according to the results uh, because this could be very high. And there's another issue over here which is very interesting. Now we have thread private data that needs to be transferred to the large core. Thread private data is data that's input to the critical section that's produced by, uh, produced by uh, that's some uh, code that's outside the critical section. Right? That's essentially arguments to the critical section. That needs to be transferred to large core. So for example, if you computed uh, that, uh, this thread has computed that uh, it's, it has 16,500 A's, A characters, in its 16 pages. Well, that's a lot of A characters in 16 pages, but anyway. Uh, you ship that, that's private data for that thread, you ship that to the critical section that's executed on some other core, and that some other core takes that private data and adds it to a shared counter of A's. And that needs to be transferred. So you get worse private data locality, because now your private data that's, uh, needs, that needs to be used in the critical section needs to be sent. So now the question is, uh, how do these performance trade-offs fare? Let's take a look at them. So basically, we have fewer parallel threads in the parallel section, but we accelerate the critical sections. That's the uh, trade-off that we make. The good thing is, according to the results, accelerating critical sections offsets loss in throughput. And this is actually a favorable trade-off. As the number of cores on chip increase, the fractional loss in parallel performance decreases. What does this mean? Uh, basically, you de you're dedicating let's say, uh, one big large core. If, if your entire chip area is equivalent to eight small large cores, dedicating four of those to a large core gets rid of a significant fraction of your throughput, parallel throughput. But if your chip area is, consists of a thousand small core equivalent areas, and if you're dedicating 16 of them to a large core, 16 out of a thousand is not that much. So as your chip area increases, it's likely that your large core is not going to occupy a large fraction of your chip area, which means that your parallel throughput is not going to decrease uh, as much compared to uh, utilizing, compared to not dedicating uh, uh, that large core to uh, parallel execution. And also, as your chip area increases, there is increased contention for critical sections, and you, it makes acceleration more beneficial. So this is a good trade-off in general. And also, as I discussed, you could multi-thread the large core once you are multi-threading in the large core, uh, and you, could, you don't dedicate the large core, then you may have some benefits. But that's not explored here. Overhead of CS call, CS done versus better lock locality. Uh, accelerated critical sections avoid ping, avoids ping pong of locks among caches by keeping them at the large core, as we discussed. And that's good. Uh, and it turns out this is better. Uh, and let's take a look at this last one. This last one is very interesting, actually. Now we get more cache misses for private data. But we don't get uh, a lot of cache misses for shared data, because shared data is supposed to stay in the large caches of the large core. So which one is more common? What do you expect? Do you have more shared data in a critical section or more private data in a critical section? When, you're, when you program and you're holding a lock, are you touching more shared data or are you touching more private data? Yes? Okay, that's your experience. So maybe if you're updating a counter, for example, and if you're touching, I don't know, a thousand different threads, histograms, yes, in that case, that's true, I agree. <laughs> Is that always true? <laughs> exactly, yes. <laughs> I'll give you an example where that's not true. <laughs> but yeah, uh, so, uh, it, so basically the answer is it depends. It depends on what you're doing in the critical section. It depends on how optimized the critical section is, because if the programmer didn't optimize the critical section very well, they could actually easily incorporate a lot of private data uh, uh, into the critical section that's not necessarily useful for the critical section execution. That's the idea. Basically, the answer is it depends. Uh, and the, if you, you can read the paper for detail. So this is one example uh, uh, that you see. You have, uh, you're inserting some problems into this priority queue. It's a heap. Uh, the shared data is this heap, basically. And you want to insert only one element. In this case, it's exactly opposite of what you said. But it really depends on what you're trying to do in the critical section. If you're trying to increment just one 
bin in a histogram and you have a thousand threads contributing to it, then the private data may be larger than the shared data. In this case, shared data is larger. The, the amount of shared data that you touch is larger than the amount of private data you touch. Basically, input is this single thing. It could be anything. Uh, it could be a character string, if you will. It doesn't need to be uh, new sub-problems, but it's a character string, let's say. And you want to basically insert at the right place. Basically, to be, to, you, first of all, you need to find what's the right place. And once you find the right place, you insert it. In this case, you've touched one, two, three, four, five elements of shared data and only one element of uh, private data. So this is one example where shared data can be larger than the private data, but that's not always the case in papers analysis. So in, the ca in cases where you, your shared data is much larger than your private data, cache misses reduce. So that's the benefit you get. And we're going to tackle this again. We're going to get back to that. Uh, for cases where you have uh, more cache misses for private data, this problem can be solved because it's, it's easier to predict what private data that you're going to send to a critical section as opposed to what shared data you're going to touch. Uh, so, uh, yeah, it's harder to predict what path you're going to take over here as opposed to what private data that you're going to send. And we will see that. And, yeah, well, we're going to see that in that paper. Okay. Okay. So let's take a look at some performance results, and then we're going to take a break over here. So we're going to compare accelerated critical sections to symmetric multi-core that consists of these small cores, uh, and ACMP that consists of one large core and 12 small cores that's accelerated, accelerating MDAL serial bottleneck, but it's not accelerating the critical sections. Accelerated critical sections, large core executes not only MDAL serial part, but also critical sections, like we discussed. We're going to examine a bunch of workloads. Uh, yeah, you can see the workloads, data mining, sorting, database, web, networking. And it's go, uh, we're going to look at the results based on a multi-core x86 simulator. And the baseline is one large and 12, 12, 28 small cores with ACMP. And there's prefetchers, and you can, you can look at this in detail. So, so th there's also an on-chip interconnect that's modeled. It's important to model uh, in this case. And it happens to be a ring here. It's a bidirectional ring. Okay, so this is the performance that you get. So there are multiple points that I want to make over here. The first thing is uh, chip area is equivalent to 32 small cores. SCMP is 32 small cores, that's symmetric, multi-core. ACMP is one large and 28 small cores. Uh, and this accelerating sequential kernel is ACMP, essentially. And if you accelerate critical sections on top of that, you get this darker blue curve. And this is an equal area comparison. What is this? Uh, uh, and where the number of threads is set to the best number of threads. So what does this mean? Uh, not all applications benefit from 32 threads, right? In fact, we've seen that if you actually run MySQL at 32 threads, you're at a performance suboptimal point. You really want each application to run at the maximum, at the number of threads that provides a maximum number of performance, a ma maximum performance, maximum scalability. Now, this is actually another topic. How do you determine the best number of threads to run an application with? It's not easy. How does the programmer figure this out, right? You ha you're given 32 cores, if you run, it, run 32 threads, that's the easy thing to do. But that may not give you the best performance because the application scales up to only 15 threads. So we're going to assume that we magically know this. In fact, we know this after simulation, after the fact. Uh, we're going to assume that we know uh, what's the best number of threads you run the application with. And uh, this is the performance comparison uh, for uh, the best number of threads for each system and each application compared to the best number of threads, uh, yeah, Exactly what I said. Uh, so, for example, uh, let's take one example over here, this puzzle benchmark. It, it's a poster child for this workload. It has a lot of critical sections. Uh, its performance is 100% uh, normalized uh, with symmetric multi-core. You gain a little bit benefit by accelerating sequential kernels, but you gain a lot of benefit uh, if you accelerate critical sections. But the number of threads you run, uh, the critical, uh, the, uh, this workload, on the ACS system is different from the number of threads you run it on the baseline system and the ACMP system. We'll see the scalability curves in a little bit. So there are applications that are not very optimized, that have coarse grain locks, and there are applications that are relatively optimized, fine grain locks. And you see the difference between them. Here, accelerating the critical sections does not buy you a lot of performance, right? Here, accelerating the critical sections buys you a lot of performance. 
I mean, it's not a lot, but it's still, as you can see over here, it's about still 20%. So if your locks are very heavily optimized, you buy little performance with accelerated critical section, you gain little performance with accelerated critical sections. If the application is not very heavily optimized, you gain a lot more performance. So this is the benefit that you give to the programmer. And on average, you get significant performance improvement. So I already said everything over here. There are cases where you don't gain a lot of performance. In fact, here, for example, if you uh, uh, compare to a symmetric multi-core, dedicating a large core for serial thread execution reduces performance because this is relatively parallel, it turns out. So you reduce performance, and you don't gain much performance by exceeding the critical sections because they're not a big bottleneck, and also you're losing throughput in the parallel part. So the overheads of accelerating critical sections kicks in over here in workloads that are very heavily optimized. Okay, so let's take a look at the scalability curves. Uh, this is actually a better way of looking at performance, although it's harder to see clearly. Uh, again, this is number of threads is equal to number of cores over here, but now we have the full picture. If you use all of the cores, uh, all of the base core equivalents, uh, small core equivalents, for execution of the application. So uh, if you look at the curves over here, let's take an example, this one, page mine. Uh, basically, uh, the green curve over here is symmetric multi-core. It saturates here. If you excite uh, the serial parts, you don't gain much benefit. Maybe there's not much serial portions in this program. It saturates over here. And if you, you excite the critical sections, basically you get 4x speed up as opposed to less than 3x. And you get the 4x speed up when you actually go to 20 threads or so. Uh, so your scalability also improves in this case. The shift, the curve, uh, the the point where the maximum speed up occurs shift to the right. Other examples here: this application was not scalable before, as you can see. Now it becomes much more scalable. You keep adding threads and you gain benefits. That's almost true over here also. Uh, and you can see that there are cases where you drop performance significantly uh, in some applications if you run it at the wrong point. So it's really important. You don't want to run your parallel applications with the maximum number of cores you have because you can lose performance easily, even compared to a single thread over here. OK, and there are other cases that you can take a look over here. But in, in all of these cases, one, two, three, four, I think seven, uh, scalability of the application improves to a point that is to the right. More threads, basically. OK. so. Basically, what we've covered is accelerating critical sections by executing them on a powerful core. This improves performance, and you can see the numbers over here. It's relatively significant. And it also improves scalability. And we're going to generalize the idea after we come uh, back from the uh, break. Basically, we'd like to not do it only for critical sections, but we'd like to figure out the bottlenecks in programs. We'd like to find the critical paths, if you will, and we'd like to execute them on this large core, on a powerful core. Uh, then how do you do it becomes a question. So this is the paper that we've covered. Uh, there are a lot of interesting questions, like how do you actually customize uh, this core for execution on the critical section? That's very interesting also, which we didn't tackle. Uh, but there's more to tackle here. OK, maybe we should take a break over here, and then we're going to generalize the idea and make it even more powerful. Let's take a break until, uh, I guess, 50 past, 15 minutes. OK, let's get started. Mm. So we're going to cover more ideas now. We're going to generalize the concept of X-ray critical sections and make it uh, even more powerful. Uh, as I said, we're not going to specialize these cores as much as they should be, I think. But there is a lot more potential, in my opinion, to uh, achieve even more specialization. So right now, parallel computing is done in relatively general purpose cores. But there is a lot of potential for specialization, I think. Uh, both in the core design as well as the accelerator design for parallel computing. Okay, so these are the parallel, uh, bottlenecks that we have in multi-threaded application. Basically, I'll define the bottleneck as any code segment for which threads content. In other words, wait for. Uh, m dot serial portions that is an example. Uh, there are four of these. m dot serial portion, only one thread exists. So in a sense, there's only one thread, so everybody's waiting for that thread to be done, right? If you have a single thread pro pro program, everybody's waiting for that to be done. In a single thread pro program, the parallel fraction is 0%. That's another way of thinking about it. This is really a continuum. There is no single thread, multi-thread difference. It's just a parallel fraction difference. Uh, critical sections, they ensure mutual exclusion. They're likely to be on the critical path if they're contended, as we've discussed. Uh, 
barriers and ensure all threads reach a point before anybody or some, or some fraction of threads continue. Uh, the latest thread arriving at the barrier is on the critical path. Pipeline stages, we've discussed this before, we're going to get back to it again. Different stages of a loop iteration may execute on different threads and slowest stage makes all of the other threads or other stages to wait. And that slowest stage is on the critical path. And we've, I've given you examples of this when we talked about parallel application memory scheduling. We're going to look at a little bit more. So uh, th that's one observation. Basically, we don't have just critical sections, just serial portions. We have barriers and pipeline stages. How do we do uh, accelerate them? Uh, and the second observation is limiting bottlenecks actually change over time. Basically, not all critical sections are equal. Not all of these bottlenecks are equal. Sometimes one is more important than the other. Sometimes uh, multiple of them are important. And you would like to identify them dynamically. And this changes relatively frequently. So let's take a look at this cooked up program where you have two critical sections. You basically have a full linked list and an empty linked list. And each thread does the following. Basically, it uh, takes a lock in one critical section. It basically removes an element from the full linked list with some algorithm. You don't need to uh, think about that right now. And after that, it does some computation on the removed elements and then takes the other lock, the lock corresponding to uh, list B, and inserts that element into the initially empty list B. Every thread does that. And if you think about every thread doing that, they go through two critical sections, the blue one and the red one. And the non-critical section is everything else that's outside. And if you look at the contention that you have on these critical sections, it changes a lot over time. On the x-axis, we have time over here, and this is millions of cycles. So it's very fine-grained. And on the y-axis, this is contention. This is the number of threads that are waiting for a particular lock, lock A or lock B. Initially, all of the threads are contending for list A, clearly, because list A is full. And there's a lot of contention in terms of removing from that. So many threads are waiting uh, for uh, that lock A, uh, if you actually have 32 threads. Over time, they keep inserting into lock B. Initially, that lock is not contended. But over time, the number of elements in this linked list becomes smaller. And the waiting because of that reduces. As a result, uh, the contention on this critical section reduces, whereas the contention on this critical section increases. And at the end of the program, of course, uh, the contention uh, goes to zero for both of them. So if you look at the execution uh, a timeline of this program, it's cooked up, but cooked up programs, it, whenever you cook up a portion of code, you, I can guarantee you that it's somewhere in the world executing <laughs> some version of it. Software is so diverse that this sort of stuff actually exists. You take out stuff from a populated data structure, you put it into a not so populated, initially not so populated data structure. As you can think of it that way. And this is a good demonstration because you can measure the effects nicely here. So if you look over here, initially while the uh, list, list, is, uh, list A is relatively full, uh, you have a lot of contention on list A. And later on that becomes, uh, initially that's a limiter, but over time limiter, limiting or contending bottleneck, bottleneck changes to lock B. And somewhere in between, Maybe both of them are limiters, right? So which bottleneck to accelerate becomes a question. Accelerate the critical sections, accelerate everything, right? But maybe that's not a good idea, right? You would really like to do this selectively for those critical sections that are really the bottlenecks. Because otherwise you're wasting energy, you're causing contention for between critical sections, you're causing all this false serialization. So you really want to focus your efforts on what is the really limiting bottleneck. This is another example. Uh, this is a real application. Basically, this is MySQL running some queries with 16 threads. It's an example timeline. As you see, it's 8 million cycles only. And there are two different locks that we examine. If you look over here, lock log, the, uh, the lock that protects the log is the bottleneck. Database log is the bottleneck. So it's causing uh, a lot of thread waiting to 14 threads over here, for example. And it's still pretty significant. It's causing waiting for 7 threads over here. And here, it happens that uh, some other lock lock that opens the database tables is the bottleneck. So it's causing waiting for many threads uh, in different points in time. So bottlenecks shift in real applications as well. So the idea of bottleneck identification of, uh, and scheduling exploits this insight, basically. The key insight is that thread waiting uh, reduces parallelism and is likely to reduce performance. When a thread waits, it's not a good thing because it's there 
uh, to do uh, to make progress. It shouldn't wait. And code that's causing the most thread waiting is the code that's most likely to be on the critical path. That's the insight. It's not always, but it's likely to be on the critical path uh, of execution. Meaning that if you accelerate it, you can actually improve performance. So the key idea is to dynamically identify the bottlenecks that cause the most thread waiting in the program and accelerate them in some way. Using powerful cores and an asymmetric multiprocessor is one example, but you could imagine many other potential techniques. We're going to look at the first uh, using uh, ACMP in this case. So this is again a hardware software cooperative approach. You can try to do this purely in hardware. It's a lot of hardware overhead to detect these bottlenecks. Uh, but if the software is written in a nice manner, such that the compiler, library, and hopefully not the programmer, the programmer sticks to the libraries, but somebody else does this stuff, uh, annotates the bottleneck code, and implements waiting for bottlenecks, those bottlenecks can be exposed to the hardware, potential bottlenecks. Uh, so, and the, uh, the compiler generates a binary containing instructions that annotate these bottlenecks, and the hardware by using that information, can measure the thread waiting cycles that's caused by each bottleneck, potential bottleneck, and accelerate the bottlenecks that are most contended. Basically, that are, accelerate the bottlenecks with the highest thread waiting cycles. Which bottleneck has caused the most thread weight? So we're going to look at both of these over here. So let's take a look at the software portion a little bit. How do you annotate the bottleneck code, and how do you implement waiting for bottlenecks? So this is one example, uh, critical section. right? So you basically uh, do something to be able to acquire the lock, and then you acquire the lock, and then you're in the critical section, and then you release the lock. So essentially, what we're going to do is we're going to turn this into a function call, or library call. Uh, and if you're programming with libraries, you have critical section enter and critical section exit. And it's easy to actually compile this into a, a, a function call like this, and then insert the necessary instructions to keep track of the bottlenecks. So we're going to have a new instruction called bottleneck call that's going to be communicated to the hardware. This basically keeps track of the bottleneck ID. This is the particular bottleneck that you're going to call, potential bottleneck. Uh, and it's, you should go jump to target PC to call it. That's the idea. And somebody needs to enumerate all potential bottlenecks such that hardware can keep track of which bottleneck is causing the most thread waiting. That's called BID. And uh, the critical section itself and the uh, entry into critical section is encapsulated in this function call. Uh, and you do the, exactly the same thing that the critical section would do. And this ends with the bottleneck return. Bottleneck return means that the bottleneck is executed, it's done, this function call is done, uh, so that the hardware can stop incrementing, for example, any thread waiting cycles it may be keeping track of. OK. So you basically encapsulate the critical section with bottleneck call and bottleneck return instructions. Now, how do you do the waiting? So here, what's happening is you cannot acquire the lock, so you need to wait. So that, that, that waiting is implemented in some way in software today. You can sleep, for example, which may not be a good thing, depending on what you're waiting for. You can actually have queues when, whenever the, you, know, you, can, you can have many different synchronization primitives. But we want to keep, take into account, uh, we want to be able to count how long we wait for this. Basically, we add a bottleneck wait instruction. Basically, if you're waiting here, if you're in this loop, you're waiting, and you're actually waiting for bottleneck ID, and you're waiting for, uh, for someone to set this watch address such that you can wake up. That's one implementation of it over here. Uh, Intel x86 architectures have M8 instructions so that are similar, but they're not ta tailored for bottleneck, bottlenecks. So whenever uh, a thread is waiting, here it executes the bottleneck wait instructions, uh, and the bottleneck wait instruction increments some hardware counter saying, this bottleneck ID has caused waiting. Now you can actually keep track of how much waiting each bottleneck causes. Right? That's the idea. So this is used to keep track of waiting cycles caused by the, each bottleneck. And these are used to enable acceleration as well as delineate uh, bottleneck call and bottleneck return. So if you have these nice encapsulation, you can ship that function, the bottleneck call, to some other place. Right? It could be an accelerator. It could be a large core. OK, so that's one example. This is critical section. And you need to modify the code slightly. Who does it? Essentially, ideally, the programmer doesn't do this. Ideally, the programmer basically writes the critical section, and underlying library has, uh, and the compiler uh, turns the code into this. So if you have a barrier, it looks like this. Uh, essentially, uh, you have a bottleneck call. Uh, 
uh, bottleneck ID, and then you enter the barrier. And if uh, while not all threads are in the barrier, you're waiting for some other thread to come to the barrier, basically. So a bottleneck happens over here, bottleneck wait. And uh, you exit the barrier. So basically, but the bottleneck call goes over here, basically. You, you have some code that's running for the barrier. Uh, and uh, this can become the bottleneck. And some other thread may be waiting for some other thread to run for the barrier. Right? That's exactly what's happening in a barrier. When, when a thread reaches the barrier, it enters the barrier and waits for the other threads. And while it's waiting, the barrier is becoming a bigger bottleneck because you're incrementing the waiting cycles that are due to that bottleneck ID. And some other thread is running for the barrier, basically. This is the code that you need to execute to get to the barrier. This is the parallel part, actually, of the program. And it's designated as a potential bottleneck over here. Make sense? So it's a different code structure, but you can keep track of how much waiting this particular barrier causes uh, uh, to other threads. And you can do this also for uh, limiter stages, uh, just like this. So if you have a pipeline parallel program, uh, Essentially, uh, this is the, uh, you have a bottleneck call to this, and uh, you basically uh, get, uh, because this is pipeline parallel, it's really a pipeline as we discussed last time. Uh, this is your pipeline stage, and you have an input queue, and you have an output queue, and you initially need to take something out of your input queue, and if your input queue is empty, then the previous stage, this is the previous ID, uh, is causing you to wait because it's not generating something fast enough for you. Uh, and then if your input queue is not empty, then you dequeue the work from here, do the work in the stage, and then you look at the output queue. If your output queue is full, then the next stage is not doing its job because output queue is full. Uh, so next BID over here is the bottleneck. So you increment the waiting on the next BID. That's what this is doing. And then you enqueue the next work after you're done. Okay. And then you have the bottleneck return. So it's basically you can express uh, all of these synchronization constructs by rewriting of the code slightly as bo with bottleneck call, bottleneck wait, and bottleneck return instructions to keep track of bottleneck waiting and to delineate where the bottleneck starts and where the bottleneck ends. So if this bottleneck, if this particular stage, for example, has caused a lot of waiting, it can be shipped to uh, uh, a large core. Because bottleneck call starts here and bottleneck return ends here. Make sense? That's how you keep track of who's causing waiting uh, to you and to others. OK, now we actually annotated the bottleneck code and implemented waiting for bottlenecks with these new instructions. You ship this to the hardware. What does the hardware do? So let's take a look at the hardware overview. Basically, uh, performance limiting bottleneck identification and acceleration are independent tasks. You, can, you need to identify them, and then you can do many, many things to accelerate these bottlenecks, right? Acceleration can be accomplished in multiple ways. You can increase the core frequency and voltage, for example, if the, actually, uh, uh, the, the turbo boost feature uh, that is present in many Intel processors today is essentially a bottleneck acceleration task, uh, although it's a very simple one. Whenever you have a single thread, you actually boost the frequency and voltage of that particular core that thread is running on, right? It's a very simple example. But you could do this uh, turbo boosting whenever you figure out, oh, you have a very strong, uh, very, very contended bottleneck running on this particular core, right? And then you could reduce the frequency and voltage of other non-bottleneck code, uh, non-bottleneck non cores. That's, that's one example. You could prioritize uh, the bottleneck code or bottleneck core uh, in shared resources, as we've seen in parallel application memory scheduling. This is essentially how you determine the bottlenecks to accelerate, uh, to, to prioritize the threads in the memory scheduler. Or you could migrate the bottleneck to faster cores in an asymmetric multi-core. And we're going to look at that one uh, in, this, in the next slides. So let's take a look at how we can measure the thread waiting cycles for each bottleneck. This is going to be relatively easy, but uh, you need some hardware structures to keep track of this. So uh, basically, we want to determine the thread waiting cycles for each bottleneck. Let's assume that you have two small cores and one large core. We're going to add a bottleneck table that keeps track of how much waiting each bottleneck that's been executed uh, has caused. So let's say uh, a thread executes the bottleneck wait instruction. The bottleneck table records that and counts, increments the number of waiters for that bottleneck because multiple cores may be waiting for that bottleneck. And basically it initializes the thread waiting 
cycles. Now, while the score is waiting for the bottleneck, if it, it hasn't uh, finished waiting for the bottleneck, so the bottleneck table keeps incrementing. Uh, the uh, thread waiting cycles for bottlenecks that have waiters that are greater than or equal to one, or uh, greater than or equal to greater than zero, let's say. So it keeps them incrementing, and at some point, another core starts waiting for the bottleneck. Assume that there are some other cores over here that's holding the bottleneck. Uh, and these, uh, now the number of waiters increased, and you keep incrementing by two. So that's how you keep track of uh, the cycles. And when, when the bottleneck wait instruction is done, you actually send a signal to the bottleneck table, which decrements the number of waiters. So that's one way of implementing it. Of course, you could make it a little bit coarser grain, but we're not going to go into those optimizations here. And after some point, the number of waiters becomes zero. Now you have the thread waiting cycles for each potential bottleneck. And you keep accumulating this over time. And you can reset these counters sometimes, of course, right? Now we've determined the thread waiting cycles for each bottleneck using these bottleneck weight instructions. How do we accelerate bottlenecks with the highest thread waiting cycles? It's also relatively simple. You have the different bottlenecks uh, recorded. They have different thread waiting cycles in the bottleneck table. Uh, whenever a core needs to execute a bottleneck call, it basically consults the bottleneck table, asks the bottleneck table, is this a bottleneck that I should execute myself or should I ship it to the large core? So, and the bottleneck table compares the thread waiting cycles that it has seen for this bottleneck to a sum threshold. If that threshold, the thread waiting cycle is not high enough, then the bottleneck table tells the core, execute your bottleneck locally because it's not a critical bottleneck according to my calculations or what I've seen. And then the core executes it locally and some others may wait for that bottleneck while the core is executing it locally and then the bottleneck table increments all those counters, of course, right? So that's how it is. Now let's say the core gets to the bottleneck call 4700 in this case, ask the bottleneck table, should I execute it locally or should I uh, actually send it to the large core? Bottleneck table compares it to the threshold and says, okay, this bottleneck is really important, so don't execute it locally, execute it remotely. And the small core then prepares for execution remotely. Of course, it doesn't take this long, hopefully. You, 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 you cache the structure inter inter internally over here to accelerate this process. Uh, you execute remotely. Now, to be able to execute remotely, a large core has a scheduling buffer. This is very similar to the critical section request buffer, but it's really a bottleneck scheduling buffer. And we don't want this to be FIFO because we know a lot more information in terms of bottlenecks. Which bottleneck is more important, potentially, right? You have the thread waiting cycles. So, the small core sends basically similar information to what we discussed before. The bottleneck ID, the program counter to start from, the stack pointer, the core ID, such that uh, uh, basically the context that you need to start executing the bottleneck. And also thread waiting cycles, which is not put here, but you should send the thread waiting cycles if you want to do the prioritization, the scheduling buffer over here. And at some point, large core prioritizes based on which bottleneck is more important. At some point, this bottleneck becomes the most important one to schedule, and it schedules it, and then executes it. And then after the bottleneck is executed, there's a bottleneck return instruction that's executed in the large core which basically sends back a done signal to the small core that, and then the small core can continue execution. So it's a very similar client and server model again, except it's a little bit more complicated right now because there's, we know more information about the bottlenecks. And not all bottlenecks uh, get sent to large core in this case. So we're going to lose some potential benefits because not all shared data unlocks will stay over here. There's some ping-ponging effect that we will cause because some bottlenecks are uh, uh, executed locally in the small course, but the benefit we get by identifying these critical bottlenecks will be much higher than that. Okay, so this, you can say, okay, the bottleneck table sounds like a global bottleneck itself in, in hardware, and it is actually. You don't want, every time you get a bottleneck, you don't want to go through the interconnect, ask the bottleneck table, should I execute it? So basically, what happens is you really have uh, cache portions of this table, internally over here. And this acceleration index table basically tells you whenever you get a bottleneck call, it tells you quickly, should you execute it locally or remotely? It's essentially a cache of this bottleneck table over here. It may not be perfectly consistent, but that's okay. This is only for acceleration, right? There's no correctness issue over here. Whether you execute a bottleneck over here or over here should not matter. It's executed in the end, as long as the code is written correctly. And 
Uh, once in a while, uh, the, this exa these excitation index tables are updated by the bottleneck table, especially when something changes in the bottleneck table, uh, saying that, oh, this bottleneck should be executed in the large core zero, for example. So you don't uh, update this all the time. You update it when something changes, when the bottleneck table says, OK, this bottleneck should be accelerated uh, in the large core. Otherwise, you basically accelerate locally. So this table can be optimized. OK, any questions? So this is exactly what I mean when, when, we, when I say a distributed system on a chip. This is essentially a distributed system on a chip right now, very similar to the distributed system programming models. Uh, so basic mechanisms for BIS, you need to determine thread waiting cycles, you need to accelerate the bottlenecks, and we have covered that. And there are also mechanisms to improve performance and generality. Uh, you need to deal with false serialization still, because you may have multiple bottlenecks that you can otherwise execute in parallel in the small course. But if you send, them to the, send both of them to the large core, they become serialized again. Same, same issue exists over here. There's also the idea of preemptive acceleration and support for multiple large cores. Uh, I'm not going to go through all of these. You can read the paper for more detail. Preemptive acceleration is a mechanism that you really need to accelerate barriers, basically. You need to preemptively uh, accelerate some code that's running for the barrier. That's an interesting thing, but you should read the paper for more detail. OK, so hardware cost, it's not that bad. Uh, the difficulty in the hardware cost is really uh, the implementation uh, complexity and ha handling these tables. But storage cost is not very high, actually, if you look at this. OK, so let's take a look at the performance trade-offs. It's going to be also very similar to accelerated critical sections. Basically, we're executing the walnuts faster right now, but we have fewer parallel threads because we're dedicating a large core for bottleneck acceleration. And it turns out acceleration of the bottlenecks offsets the loss in throughput with large core cons. And we've already discussed this. Similar trade-off. Shared, better shared data locality is not as good as accelerated critical sections, but we, also, we still have worse private data locality, although private data locality is better than accelerated critical sections slightly here. Shared data mostly stays on the large core. That's good, especially for bottlenecks that are important. Private data migrates to the large core. This is bad, but latency can be hidden with data marshalling, as we will discuss next. And you have the benefit of acceleration that you get in the bottleneck, but you have a migration latency. Migration latency is usually hidden by waiting. That's good. Because if something is a bottleneck, it's very likely that something is executing that bottleneck in the large core while you're migrating the bottleneck from another core uh, to the large core. So it's usually hidden, actually. Unless the bottleneck is not contended, unless you made the wrong choice, the bottleneck is uh, really um, a, a bottleneck uh, that you shouldn't migrate. But maybe that's not likely on the critical path anyway, if it's not contended, uh, meaning that you actually waste some energy and large core resources, but uh, maybe it doesn't affect performance. It may affect performance of the other bottlenecks, of course. OK, so this paper has an evaluation methodology similar to what we've discussed earlier. There are a bunch of applications. Some of them are critical section intensive. Some of them are barrier intensive. Some of them are pi pipeline parallel. And uh, yeah, you can see that. And we'll take a look at some of the results. OK, the comparison points, uh, symmetric CMP, as you've seen, all small cores. ACMP is the baseline. It accelerates only MDAL serial portions. And accelerated critical sections, of course, now is the baseline. It's applicable to multi-threaded workloads, not to pipeline parallel workloads, for example, because what is the notion of a critical section, a pipeline parallel workload? It doesn't exist, really. Uh, well, you can have critical section, of course, in a pipeline parallel workload, but most, if most of it is pipeline parallel, then you're bottlenecked by the pipeline parallelism. Uh, yeah. And feedback-directed pipelining, basically, this is a mechanism that was proposed. It's a software-based mechanism to identify the slow pipeline stages. You could actually design software-based mechanisms as well. Actually, everything I've said could potentially be done in software, but it's a lot of overhead to identify the bottlenecks in software to ship, to migrate a thread uh, in software without having this hardware support on the interconnect. That's a lot of overhead to do that. But there is work that shows that you could gain benefits if you do it really, really carefully. You, know, you can accelerate the slowest pipeline stages, for example. It's apl applicable to pipeline parallel workloads that are examined. So let's take a look at the performance improvement uh, overall. Uh, so the baseline, the blue bars, are accelerated critical sections and, and feedback-directed pipeline, the software-based library that does at a coarse grain uh, acceleration of the slowest stage. So it, it determines the slowest stage at a very coarse grain. And then it uh, essentially ships that slowest stage to a large core. Uh, 
but uh, if, you actually, if, you, if you look at it in a coarse grain, that's not good as we've discussed because coarse grain, the bottlenecks change at a very fine grain manner in terms of time. Uh, so if you look at ACS and FTP, on average, they improve performance by, I don't know, this is 17%. So they improve performance as expected. Um, but BIS improves you performance even more. So there are some workloads where ACS is applicable and it does improve performance, but it doesn't always improve performance. Uh, there are some workloads where ACS is not applicable, but feedback directed pipelining is applicable because these are pipeline parallel, as you see. And sometimes actually you don't improve performance at all, as you see over here, because you lose parallel throughput. Uh, and BIS improves performance. Uh, so these are the workloads where limiting bottlenecks change a lot over time, actually, and you get a lot of performance benefit uh, with uh, BIS, uh, maybe not so much with ACS because it doesn't adapt to this limiting bottlenecks. And barriers, in this case you have barrier based programs and you cannot accelerate them uh, with either of these methods, ACS or FTP, but you get significant benefit uh, with uh, BIS because you actually take into account this particular bottleneck and on average this is what you get. Basically you get significant performance improvements and also scalability for uh, four of the workloads actually improves, but it's not here, it's in the paper. Any questions? It makes sense, right? Okay, so why does it work? I think it's always a good idea to do this analysis. Uh, this is actually a very interesting analysis that's not easy to do. Uh, basically, we would like to understand what is the fraction of the execution time that's spent on predicted important bottlenecks. Predicted important means uh, we make a prediction and we say, oh, this is a bottleneck that's causing a lot of thread waiting cycles. Right. What is the fraction of time that we spent uh, in, uh, in those predicted important bottlenecks? And you can, count, you can count this. In ACS and FTP, it's about 55%. In BIS, you get about 81%. Right. So 81% of the time, you're executing something on the large core. You can think of it that way also. Because you're predicted important and you ship it to the large core in both cases. In ACS and FTP, the way you determine predicted important is if you're in the critical section, you ship it. Right. So it's much higher in BIS because BIS takes into account many other types of bottlenecks. It's not just the critical sections, right? It's also uh, pipeline uh, stages. It's also uh, you know, barriers. Okay. So what fraction of it is actually critical? It turns out this is a harder study to do because you really need to figure out what's on the critical path. And you need to run your program backwards to actually do the study to figure out which thread is really on the critical path and is it really executing on the large core at that point in time. It's not an easy study to do, but if you actually do the study, this is what you get. So you're spending about 55% of your time over here with ACS and FTP on uh, bottlenecks that you think are important, but only this green portion is actually critical. So you're wasting large core execution over here uh, and you're doing the correcting over here. Basically, you can think of uh, coverage as, a, uh, and if that's true for BIS also, BIS basically, the actually critical portion increases. Okay, so basically uh, 50, let's say 59% of the time, you're executing something that is actually critical on the large core. That's much lower in ACS and FTP. So let's take a look at two metrics. Coverage is the fraction of program critical path that is actually identified as bottlenecks. Essentially, it's these green bars over here. 39% of the program critical path is actually identified as bottlenecks in ACS and FTP, which is really low. It becomes 59% in bottleneck identification and scheduling, which is still low, which means that these uh, prediction mechanisms are covering a good fraction of your program, 60%, but it's not all of your program which means that there's still room for improvement. You're not identifying some bottlenecks well. Uh, maybe some part of your program that's on the critical path is not a bottleneck, is not considered a bottleneck, right? That's possible. Or maybe you're doing mispredictions, that's why uh, that's happening. So there's room for improvement, basically. Ideally, you would like to, at any given cycle, you don't want to, keep, you don't want to leave the large core idle, right? Because at any given cycle, some instruction must be on the critical path of execution. And if you execute it faster, that's better. You reduce the critical path. But we're not there yet. We're at 60%, 59%. So there's room for improvement over here, which is really interesting. And this is a hard resource problem. Uh, 
But it's a very important research problem, identifying what's on your critical path. Even in a single thread program, it's not easy because some instructions are on the critical path in a single thread program, some instructions are not. In a multi-thread program, it becomes even more difficult. Of course, there's a caveat here, right? The caveat is that whenever you uh, ship something on your critical path, it gets accelerated on the large core. But that's not necessarily true also, right? That was our assumption. If you execute something on the large core, it speeds up. That's not true. The simulations actually model the fact that it's not true. If you ship something to the large core and the large core doesn't provide you benefit, too bad, you don't get benefit. But if you identify it and if you somehow speed it up, then you, get benefit. you would get benefit. And accuracy is the, the identified bottlenecks that are on the critical path over total identified bottlenecks. Basically, how large is this green portion of the bar compared to the total blue part? That's the accuracy of your identification. In ACS, it's about 72%. In ABIS, it's 73%, 74%. Basically, 74% of the stuff that's running on the large core is actually on the critical path. So what happens to the rest? The rest you're running on the large core at the expense of some real critical path. So you're wasting energy and you're not improving performance, basically. So if you want to, accuracy is not as important, but it's important still. So there's room to improve uh, in, in these mechanisms. And this is really the state of the art uh, at this point. Let's take a look at scaling a little bit. So if you look at scaling, uh, this is area of the chip in terms of small cores equivalent. Uh, and this is the benefit that you get over ACMP with ACS and BIS. So it turns out bottleneck identification and scheduling scales nicely. Uh, because if you have more small cores, you have contention due to bottlenecks, more contention. And loss of parallel throughput due to the large core that's dedicated for bottleneck acceleration reduces, as we discussed earlier. So scaling is good, but of course it saturates, as you can see. The performance improvement is not increasing very fast if you go from 32 cores to 64 cores. Okay, and if you have more large cores, it's actually good because it can accelerate independent bottlenecks without hopefully reducing the parallel throughput if you have enough cores in the system. So if your area is equivalent to 64 equivalent small cores, and if you have three large cores, that's when you get the maximum performance over here with this uh, maximum speed up. So it's good to have more large cores because that reduces false serialization. That gives you more flexibility uh, uh, in bottleneck acceleration. So to summarize, basically we've discussed that serializing bottlenecks of different types limit performance of multi-thread application and their importance changes over time. And this is a hardware software cooperative mechanism that uh, dynamically identifies bottlenecks that cause the most thread weighting and accelerates them on large cores of an asymmetric uh, chip multiprocessor. It's applicable to these bottlenecks. Maybe there are other bottlenecks in the code, but these are the parallel bottlenecks that are significant. So what is rest is the good question, right? What is missing? Because we're at 59%, as you can see, on those applications. And some applications are actually much less than 59%. If you go over here, uh, this one, for example, it looks pretty bad. It's about 30%, right? Actually, the green part is much worse. Here, there's a lot of misprediction. The green part is less than 10%. So in some cases, uh, the identification of the bottleneck is not working really well. OK, but overall, it works well. Basically, uh, it improves performance. Uh, and scalability, and uh, it, uh, the benefits increase with more cores. Essentially, this is a comprehensive fine-grained bottleneck acceleration mechanism with no programmer effort, assuming the programmer is already programming with libraries in these bottlenecks. If you're, of course, uh, programming uh, with loads and stores and instructions for synchronization, then you'll need to do this yourself, right? Or you need to have a mechanism that automatically identifies those code constructs as bottlenecks. Okay, and this is the paper. Any questions? Thoughts? I think this is interesting. This is a hard area of research. It's not easy, actually, for multiple reasons. One is, first of all, it's difficult conceptually. There are a lot of difficult concepts. Second, infrastructure is also very difficult. So it's not easy to actually build infrastructure to simulate these things. So if you're building a single thread, multi-programmed execution infrastructure, that's much, much easier than uh, actually modeling uh, these dependencies between the threads. It's not only uh, not easy, but also slow. Because you want to actually look at large scale system behavior and you want to simulate all of these interactions between threads and it becomes very slow in the end. So 
So for multiple reasons, it's not an easy area to do research in. But it's a fascinating area, I think, and there should be more research in this area. Uh, I think once people figure out that machine learning is not the only thing to do research on, they will move to some of these areas also, uh, again. Okay, so let's do one more thing. Let's talk about this private data locality that I promised uh, and how we handle that, and then uh, we'll conclude. Uh, so I'm going to generalize the model even more. Uh, so the models that we've been discussing actually uh, are examples of what I call staged execution. So if you think about staged execution, in the most general sense, you speed up a program by dividing, into, dividing it into pieces. That's parallelism also, but I'll call it staged execution. Uh, you split the program into segments and you run each segment on the core best suited to it. Ideally, this is the uh, ultimate form of heterogeneity. And each core is assigned some sort of work queue and it stores the segments that, uh, to be run on it. Uh, there are a bunch of benefits. What you can do is this, this way you get, you exploit inter-segment parallelism first of all. Multiple different segments are executing on different cores, so that's the parallelism part. There's heterogeneity and specialization part. You accelerate each segment or critical path using specialized or heterogeneous cores. And on top of that, you get energy efficiency benefits because you can customize the core for the segment that it's usually executing. Right. So there are multiple things over here. That's why this is the most general form, I think. And you also improve the locality of within segment data. If, you'd, if you form the segment such that the, each segment, each instance of a segment is operating on uh, a shared working set, then you improve the locality by ensuring those segments that are working on the same uh, data are executing on the same specialized core. So there are a bunch of benefits from the stage execution model. And there are many examples. So what we've been discussing, like accelerated critical sections, is an example of this actually. We'll talk about that. Uh, essentially you have a critical segment and non-critical segment. These are two different types of segments. Bottleneck identification and scheduling is also dividing the program into segments uh, based on dynamic behavior of the program. Producer-consumer pipeline parallelism, pipeline parallel programs, you have a producer and you have a consumer. Those are two different segments. We're going to look at that. And many task parallelism uh, approaches like Silk, I don't know if you know about Silk, but Intel's thread building blocks and Apple's Grand Central Dispatch. Essentially, they are, they're task-based programming models. Tasks are essentially segments. And ideally, you would like to do what I just discussed over here. And if you have special purpose cores and functional units, you can consider partitioning your program into segments, right? Segment that executes on the CPU, segment that executes on the video encoder, segment that executes on the speech recognizer, right? Those are all different segments. So if you look at a very general program that consists of loads and stores, uh, if you want to uh, execute on the stage execution model, you split the code into segments in some way. In this case, I've shown you just an example. Segment zero, segment one, segment two. You basically uh, create work queues uh, and instance of segment zero go to this core, instance of segment one goes to this core, instance of segment two goes to this core. And now you can specialize the cores. The next level of animation over here should have been this core zero becomes something different, this core one becomes something different, and this core two becomes something different, right? That's the specialization. And uh, how do you spawn the segments? This is one way of doing it. This is, so let's assume that segments are spawned by each other. You execute segment zero on core zero. It spawns segment one, and then it spawns seg uh, segment one spawns segment two. This is one way of doing it. There are multiple ways of doing it, uh, but we're gonna look at this way. And then you may have another instance of segment zero here, another instance of segment zero here, and then they both spawn. As a result, you get segment level parallelism. Uh, but uh, segment zero and segment one have dependencies on each other. So it's very similar to actually uh, dividing a loop iteration, right? Loop iterations, part of the loop iteration is here, and it's a pipeline parallel uh, version of it. But I'm going to map uh, critical sections on top of this model also. You can, you can say non-critical section, okay, critical section over here. Maybe you don't have this pun over there in that case. Okay, so uh, let's take a look at two examples. Uh, so whenever you actually communicate between the segments, you're communicating some data that's stored here, and you're loading that data over here. And that's causing communication. There's also shared data communication potentially, uh, but we'll see that. So accelerated critical sections maps to the state execution model. The idea is to ship the critical sections to a large core and an asymmetric multi-core. Segment zero is the non-critical section. Segment one is the critical section. 
And segment zero is executed on potentially many cores, right? Of course, we've discussed the benefits. Uh, Producer-consumer pipeline parallelism is another. You have a producer thread and you have a consumer thread. You, have a, you can split a loop iteration into multiple pipeline stages, where one stage consumes data produced by the previous stage. Essentially, what we have in this picture over here. You have multiple stages. Uh, and each stage can run on a different core. In this case, segment n is stage n. So you, have, you can have many, many different segments in this case. And they could have particular code patterns, particular data that they manipulate. So you can specialize the cores also. So the benefit is you get stage level parallelism and better locality, you get faster execution. Okay, the problem, whenever you have this sort of model, the problem becomes the locality of intersegment data. When I mentioned private data, it's essentially intersegment data uh, earlier. So this core, when it executes segment one, it loads Y, it gets a cache miss. Why? Because Y was generated by core zero and stored in the private cache of core zero. So you need to transfer the Y whenever this core gets the cache miss. This core, uh, when it loads Z, it gets a cache miss because Z was actually produced by core one and it it's, it's staying at core one's private cache. So you need to transfer Z. And this transfer becomes the critical path because this is the first time you're loading load, uh, the cache block that's containing Y over here. It doesn't exist and it shouldn't exist because it was really written over here. right? So it's on the critical path, basically. This load needs to wait for this transfer. And if that transfer is happening across the chip, that's going to wait for a long time. So we've already seen this. Critical section incurs a cache miss when it touches data produced in the non-critical section, thread private data. That's essentially the private data problem. If you look at producer-consumer pipeline parallelism, a stage incurs a cache miss when it touches data produced by the previous stage. This thing that we looked at over here, the queue, this stage wrote to this memory location that houses the head of the queue at the, at the point that you're trying to read from here. When you're trying to read from here, you need to wait because this particular location was actually updated in the private cache of this particular core. So performance of stage execution is actually limited by intersegment cache misses and this paper has some analysis. It's not the best analysis because the numbers are not large, but it's, it's not a bad uh, analysis still. The numbers could be large if you actually simulate very large scale systems, but we didn't have, we didn't have the time to do that. Basically, if you eliminate all intersegment misses, you could gain significant performance. So pipeline parallel programs actually, you gain more than 20%. In ACS, you gain about 10% in this particular configuration. How do you eliminate all intersegment misses? Basically, you identify what data you're touching, and whenever you're touching this intersegment data, you magically assume that it's in the cache in the simulator. That's the beauty of simulation. You can do these ma magic experiments. Now the good thing is we're going to reach very close to that with a realistic mechanism. Basically we're going to get almost all of the benefit uh, that, uh, that is shown here. And this is going to become much bigger in the future actually if you have a large scale system. So let me define some terminology first. Basically intersegment data is a cache block written by one segment and consumed by the next segment. This is obvious. For example the cache block that houses Y is intersegment data, cache block that houses Z is also intersegment data in this case. Uh, generator instruction is the last instruction to write to an intersegment cache block in a segment. So in this case, store Y is a generator instruction. This previous store Y is not a generator instruction, unless there's a branch that guards store Y, the second store Y. So that in, that, in that case, both are gen potentially generator instructions. Uh, in this case, store Z is a generator instruction. And there could be multiple generator instructions for, the, uh, for a single intersegment data, clearly, depending on the paths you take. So the key observation here is that uh, the set of generated instructions is stable over execution time and across many different input sets. If an instruction is generating intersegment data, it's going to keep generating intersegment data. It's not perfect, but it's mostly stable. Which means that you can identify the generator instructions and record the cache blocks produced by the generator instructions and proactively send such cache blocks to the next segment's core before initiating the next segment. This way, while you're initiating the next segment, you're also proactively marshalling the data that you predict is going to be uh, used by that segment, the intersegment data. Not the shared data, but hopefully shared data is handled some, in some other way. So it's a powerful idea. You could actually do this purely in hardware. Uh, I'm not going to discuss that. This is going to be a hardware software cooperative mechanism also because it's easier to do it purely in hardware, actually, this one. It takes some time to identify the generator instructions, but you could. 
uh, and you don't need uh, a lot of hardware resources. And that's the paper. It's called Data Marshalling for Multicore Architectures. And we call it Data Marshalling because whenever you actually need to initiate a remote function call somewhere else, normally you need to marshal the parameters, right? To marshal the arguments to the function. Essentially, we're marshalling the arguments to the function by figuring out what those arguments could be through the generate instruction. So this again, a hardware software cooperative mechanism. You have a compiler or profile that identify, identifies generate instructions and inserts special instructions for marshalling. You, you have a binary at the end containing generator prefixes and marshal instructions. Prefixes because any store instruction can potentially be a generator. You don't need to have a, uh, you essentially have a special bit in the store saying this is a generator instructor. And uh, hardware records generator produce address and marshals the recorded blocks to the next core that needs it. So there are interesting subtleties here. I'm going to ignore a lot of the subtleties, but uh, give you the basic idea. So let's take a look at the profiling algorithm that you need to identify the generated instructions. This could be done on a single thread. Basically, you need to figure out the boundaries of the segments. And essentially, you need to figure out when a segment touches some data that's produced by a store in a previous segment. And that's intersegment data now. And then you mark the instruction that's producing that last as a generator instruction. So it's a profiling algorithm because you could do this based on dynamic profile. You could do this statically also, but we do it dynamically. Uh, anyway, we, we don't want to get into that trade-offs over here. And then you actually add uh, the Marshall instructions. Basically, uh, these Marshall instructions, so now here you see that generated instructions are marked with G. And then Marshall instructions basically uh, tell uh, the hardware when to send uh, the data that's generated by the generated instructions to the next segment and where to send the data. In this case, the Marshall instruction says send it to core one. In this case, the Marshall instruction says send it to core two. And ideally, you would like a virtual core uh, here as opposed to a physical core because the core can, segment can get, get mapped to uh, a different physical cores at a given time, right? So it's really marshal to this segment and marshal to this segment. And somebody needs to maintain the segment to core mapping, which, is, which needs to be done in hardware again. You could potentially do it in the uh, hypervisor and rewrite this code, of course, but uh, there's some overhead associated with it. Okay, so uh, hopefully that's simple. And you can insert these marshal instructions anywhere over here, right? Uh, of course, ideally, you would like to insert after the all of the generator instructions are done. Or you could insert at the end of the segment, but if you insert earlier, you overlap the latency of starting the next segment. So the support and cost for this, you, uh, for, for profiler, you need the generator instruction marking, uh, marshal instructions. ISA needs to be changed with a generator prefix and marshal instructions. And the library and the hardware needs to bind the next segment ID or the segment ID to a physical core. In terms of hardware, you need a marshal buffer, as we will see. This essentially stores the physical address of cache blocks to be marshaled, to be sent. And it turns out a small number of entries is enough for almost all workloads, so it's actually a small buffer. Because you just need to keep the addresses, not the data. We'll talk about how do you get the data in a little bit. Whenever you have the address, you just access the cache and get the data and send it. And you need to uh, have the ability to execute the generator prefix and marshal instructions. Of course, it's obvious if you add an instruction, you need to be able to execute it. But you also need to have the ability to push data to another cache. So it's not, uh, essentially you're pushing data to somebody else's cache, you need to have that ability. This exists in some systems, this doesn't exist in some systems today, but I think this is a very good ability to have in a system, especially if you can do this programmat programmatically like this. So let's talk about advanced and disadvantages before we move on to the results. So it turns out this buys you a timely data transfer. You push the data to the core before it's needed. I'll give you some results. You overlap the latency of starting the next segment with the data transfer for the segment. You can marshal any arbitrary sequence of lines, cache blocks, so you don't need to have a pattern here. Uh, so prefetchers, if you think about prefetchers, which we will hopefully talk about, they try to lock onto a pattern. If you have A, A plus two, A plus four, A plus six, A plus eight, you identify that pattern. Here, there's no need for a pattern. In fact, it turns out there are no patterns, in this case, in the generator instructions. So you identify the generators, not patterns, and it turns out it's low hardware cost because profiler marks generators, no need to, for the hardware to find them. But actually, you can think about how to do this in hardware, and it's not that hard to do in hardware, identifying this. We built much, much more sophisticated branch predictors. It's not that hard to do. This advance, of course, now it requires profile and ISA support. It's not always accurate because generator set is conservative. What does this mean? If you actually identify many generators, 
you marshal a lot of data, but it's not a lot, as we will see. Uh, you marshal more data than you really need because you may have branches in the code, right? You may really have two potential generators, but you don't know which one will really generate, uh, which one will really be used in the end. Uh, so as a result, you may cause pollution at the remote core and wasted bandwidth on the interconnect, but this is not a large problem as the number of intersegment blocks is small. So let's take a look at this in operation uh, with two cases, accelerated critical sections. Basically, we're going to rewrite the program. This is the non-critical section, this is the critical section. Critical section will be shipped to the large core, and you have the generator instructions, and you have a critical section call. Let's execute it. So when, this uh, when you execute the non-critical section on small core, you get to the generator instruction, you execute it, you insert the address of the generator instruction into the L2 cache, into the, uh, into the Marshall buffer next to the L2 cache. Then you see the critical section call, which essentially initiates the critical section call on the interconnect. While that's happening, you basically go through the Marshall buffer, take every single address one by one, access the cache, get the data, and send the data, as well as the address, to the destination core's cache. And the destination, in this case, is the large core where you're shipping the critical section to. And the hope is that when the critical section actually starts executing over here, it loads Y, it gets a cache hit, as opposed to getting a cache miss if this didn't happen. OK, let's take a look at how this performs. Again, we have the similar workloads that we tested the accelerated critical sections with. And it basically buys you about 8.7% uh, performance. It doesn't matter in many applications, but it gets very close to the ideal, as you can see over here. And in cases where it doesn't get close to the ideal, it's because the Marshall buffer is not large enough. OK, so pipeline parallelism is very similar. You have stage 0, stage 1, stage 2. Stage 0, uh, you, have you add Marshall buffers to all of the cores in this case. Stage 0 is executing. It gets to a generator instruction. You basically execute the generator instruction, record the address in the Marshall buffer. Now you uh, do the Marshall instruction over here. So in, in the previous case, critical section call implicitly serves as a Marshall instruction. But you don't need to do that. You could actually have a separate Marshall instruction uh, than the critical section call. I just m made it easy. So in this case, you have to have a Marshall instruction uh, because there is no explicit call potentially. Uh, and the Marshall instruction basically starts going through the Marshall buffer. For each address in the Marshall buffer, it accesses the cache, sends the address and data to the destination core. And you get a cache hit when you actually access that data in that segment. That's the idea. And if you look at the performance of this, there are, these are actually applications of pipeline parallelism. There are a lot of interesting applications here. Uh, compression, for example, is done pipeline parallel manner, multimedia encoding, decoding. You can read the paper. Uh, and you basically get significant performance improvement, 16%, and ideal is about 21% or so. And there are cases where performance improvement is not as large. Uh, I think it was this one. Uh, the reason is that the Marshall buffer is not large enough. So if you actually increase the Marshall buffer size, you'll get even higher performance. This shows the coverage accuracy and timeliness. Uh, uh, coverage is what fraction of the intersegment misses are actually covered. Uh, it's almost 100%, as you see. Basically, if you identify the generator instructions, you can capture most of this private data. It's not true for the pipeline parallelism perfectly, but this is because of our profiling algorithms deficiencies, I think. It's not that hard, I think, to get too close to 100%. Accuracy is a different issue. Accuracy is what fraction of the data that you sent, marshaled, is actually used by the destination core. So it's 60%, 50% over here. Fraction may be misleading. How, what fra uh, how many number of, how many cache blocks uh, are averaged uh, are on average are sent per segment, you see that there are very few number of cache blocks. So it's 5 to 6.8%. If you actually send three of them wrong, maybe it's not a big deal. You waste some energy on the interconnect, yes. You waste some cache space, but it's not that bad. If this was hundreds, then this accuracy may be a problem. Right? And also timeliness is what fraction of, uh, uh, whenever you try to access this intersegment data, is it in the cache, if it's marshaled? And most of the time, it's in the cache. So it's a relatively timely mechanism. OK, so there are scaling results also. This is actually a really interesting idea, because this is an idea who, whose impact will increase uh, as people uh, increase the number of cores. So basically, performance improvement increases with three trends that are increasing. You have more cores, performance improvement increase. Higher interconnect latency, 
performance improvement increases larger, private L2 caches, performance improvement of this increases. Why? Because inter-segment data miss is becoming a larger bottleneck as you parallelize your code with all of these. More cores means that you have more communication. If you have higher interconnect latency, it means that you have longer stalls due to that communication. And if you have larger L2 cache, larger L2 caches are very good at, basically caches are not good at handling communication misses. They're not designed for communication. They're really designed for locality, right? Here, the problem we're targeting is really communication misses, right? You're communicating from one core to another. Larger caches will improve your locality, but they will not help you with communication at all. As a result, communication misses become a much bigger bottleneck over time. And this is always a problem whenever you parallelize your code. Whenever you have more machines, you hopefully get better locality, but your communication becomes a bottleneck. That's why interconnects become a bigger bottleneck as you scale up your system. Okay, so this is very interesting, I think. And this is uh, the heterogeneity. As we become more heterogeneous, this is going to become more important. And the results are in the paper, if you look in the paper. Okay, there are other applications of data marshalling. There are actually uh, other stage execution models, as we discussed, task parallelism models that are employed in the real field. Special purpose remote functional units that we discussed. And there are a bunch of academic proposals also, uh, like computation spreading. One of that, that proposal, for example, partitions system code from user code. And system code is executing on a particular core, user code is executing on some other code because they figure out that system code has very different properties than the user code. And, they, and, and the next step is, of course, specializing the system code to the user code. Uh, so that's essentially another st stage execution model. Whenever you communicate between system and user code, your uh, stages are very coarse grained in that case. Right? Okay, whenever you actually move threads and migrate threads, uh, you're also doing something like this. And this can be an enabler for even more aggressive stage execution model because you're lowering the cost of data migration. And in a simple way, actually, the, uh, this, it's not that hard to determine what data you should marshal. You just need to have the mechanisms to do it. Uh, and that important overhead in remote execution of code segments actually goes away. So whenever you're launching uh, something from the CPU and the, to the GPU in a fine grain, not in an extremely explicit way like we do it today, but if your CPU and GPU are relatively close to each other, you have the same problem basically. Today we're doing it in a very coarse grain manner, right? You're, because of the overhead of communication between CPU and GPU, you send something to the GPU and wait for a long time, and as a result you send huge tasks to the GPU to wait. But if you think of GPU as a very fine grain accelerator, you can ship function calls with only 10 instructions, you need something like this to ensure that the data communication overhead is not high. You need to proactively send the data, basically. Okay, basically remote execution of finer gain tasks become more feasible as a result of this. So hopefully you'll get finer gain parallelization and not only multi-cores, but uh, essentially accelerator-based systems. Okay, so I think we've already discussed this. Uh, basically you detect the intersegment data generator instruction and push their data to the next segment's core. And I'm gonna leave you with, with this. So you can enable new models with very fine grain execution. And this is the paper. So in the next remaining minutes, let me very quickly talk about other use of asymmetry, but unless there are questions. Questions on the stage execution? Yes? And you said like timeliness is pretty important, but like if you already initiate the, the transfer of the data, doesn't it also like benefit if it's like a cache miss, but already partially transmitted? That's right, exactly, exactly. So if, if, if you initiate it and the core needs it while the thing is uh, being transferred, you still gain some benefit. So you don't have to have it in the cache. It's very much similar to prefetching. If you covered some of the latency, that's good. Okay, I find this really fascinating because I think this is really uh, the true form of parallelization and heterogeneity. <laughs> And there's more to do in this area. So let me talk about other uses of asymmetry very, very quickly over here. Uh, this is an early paper that actually looks at heterogeneous multi-core architectures, but it doesn't use it to accelerate, improve the efficiency and scalability of multi-thread applications. It uses it in a very different way. And the different way is to, uh, to reduce energy. And this is a reasonable way of doing it. Uh, uh, basically, the idea is to implement multiple types of cores on a chip, monitor the characteristics of the running thread, like sample energy and performance, on each core periodically, and dynamically pick the core that provides the best energy and performance trade-off for a given phase. 
basically their best score depends on the optimization metric, of course, that you have. It could be energy, it could be performance, it could be energy, performance, uh, product, something like that. And they motivate, in this work, uh, heterogeneity in an interesting perspective. If you're a company who has designed generations of processors, they look like this. This is Alpha, which doesn't exist anymore. Uh, basically, it's the Digital Equipment Corporation. You have a chip that was a state of the art, uh, I don't know, 20 years ago. You still have it. Now it looks very small compared to your current state of the art chip, if you scale to the same technology, because you didn't have enough transistors at that time, so you designed it for a small number of transistors. You have another chip, another chip, and this is the current state of the art chip. And if these are the relative size of the alpha core scaled to 0 0.10 micrometer, which is pretty large right now, right? Uh, as you can see, EV8 is 80 times bigger, but provides only two to three times more single-threaded performance. So it's kind of similar to what we've been discussing, although the 80 and two to three is debatable, of course. Uh, how do they get these numbers? I don't know. Uh, basically, if you already have this, you can put them together, and you already have heterogeneity, right? And this paper examines that. They basically look at the peak power and average power and the performance of these different cores, uh, and they have some numbers. And then they design a mechanism that basically uh, tracks what is the instructions per second that you would get if you run the same instructions on these different cores. These are actually same ISA, but different cores. And as expected, EV4 performs worse than EV8, which is the latest generation. But there are some parts of the code where the performance difference is not that much. Right? You can see it as expected, right? So what they do is they basically design a mechanism that switches the running program between these cores to maximize, let's say, energy, per, uh, energy uh, delay product. That could be one metric. And I think, yeah, this is uh, for, uh, when, you, when you optimize just for energy, you execute on EV6 most of the time, but sometimes you execute on EV4, sometimes you execute on EV8. So that's if you optimize for energy. If you optimize for energy delay product, uh, you execute on EV4 and EV6 most of the time, it seems like. So that's the idea over here. Uh, so clearly, this is another use of asymmetry. It's a good use of asymmetry. In fact, ARM little and big, uh, big, big little, uh, has uh, one large core and four small cores, right? Uh, and you can do that in systems like that. You get more flexibility in the energy performance trade-off, and you can execute computation to the on the core that's best suited for it in terms of energy or energy delay, whatever metric you're trying to optimize. If you do something like this, uh, in fact, this is easier to do, right? This is easier than uh, extracting a multi-thread application. Uh, that's why it's done already uh, in existing systems. But of course, anytime you want to do something like this, your incorrect predictions become a problem. So it's good to think about these. Overhead, of course, switching becomes a problem because if you look at ARM's uh, big little, you need to switch the cores. Uh, and you have the disadvantages of asymmetric CMP, just like we've had before. Uh, and you need phase monitoring and matching algorithms. And if you're really interested, you can read the paper. What characteristics should be monitored? Once characteristics are known, how do you pick the core, right core to execute? Essentially, you want a performance prediction model. Now let's take it a little bit broadly. Let's talk about asymmetric and symmetric cores and look at the advantages and disadvantages. So advantage of asymmetric is you can provide better performance when thread parallelism is limited. You can be more energy efficient. You can schedule the computation to the core uh, type that can best execute it. But disadvantages are also many. Uh, you need to design more than one type of core. But hopefully, if you, have, if you already have the cores, that's not a problem. But I think this is going to be uh, necessary because general purpose cores, they're going to look increasingly more like accelerators. And we already have many accelerators. You need to specialize even at the core level. Uh, scheduling becomes more complicated, as we've discussed. What computation should be scheduled on the large core versus small core? Who should decide hardware versus software? And managing locality and load balancing can also become difficult because threads move between the cores, right? Transparently to the software if you're doing it in hardware level management. And again, cores have different demands from the shared resources. We've kind of discussed this when we talk about CPU, GPU architectures, but that's true for large core versus small core also. So there are a bunch of issues. I, I shouldn't call this not necessarily disadvantages, but things to be solved and limitations as well, right? These are actually problems to be solved whenever you design asymmetry. Okay, there's also another thing that I want to discuss, which is how to achieve asymmetry. Uh, so far, with the ACMP, we've been thinking type and power of cores are fixed at design time. That's static asymmetry. But dynamic asymmetry could be even more powerful, although more complex. Type and power of cores change dynamically. 
So there are two approaches to designing faster cores if you have static asymmetry. One is high frequency, high voltage, or you build a more complex, powerful core with an entirely different microarchitecture, right? just like we did. So frequency and voltage gives you, uh, this already exists actually, right? Uh, you can have some cores that are higher frequency than the others naturally, statically. Uh, that's easy to do, basically. But building a more complex and powerful core is harder. When you have two different types of cores, you have two different things to verify and two different things to get right. So static asymmetry is natural. I kind of answered this question, actually. Basically, you have chip-wide variations in frequency. So naturally, some uh, parts of the chip are faster. Some parts of the chip are actually slower. And maybe you can exploit that naturally. It's very similar to what we've discussed with Radar, for example. Right? You have process variation. As a result, some part of the DRAM chip has high retention, some part of the DRAM chip has low retention time, and you can exploit that. Dynamic is very interesting, and there's a lot of research in this area uh, also. Type and power, of course, change dynamically. There are two approaches to dynamically create faster cores also. One is boosting frequency and voltage dynamically. If you have limited power budget, you can distribute that power budget across the cores. When you're in a serial code section, you boost the frequency and voltage of that, uh, of that large core or of, of a particular core, even though it may not be large. It may be, all of the cores may be the same. You boost the frequency and voltage of the core that's executing the critical section or uh, the serial section to be very high. And that's a dynamic way of achieving asymmetry, right? You can control this. And as I said, this is done in turbo boost type of systems. You increase the frequency and voltage if that's the only thread run, that's running on the, on the system. But there's another approach which is more complex but it could enable more benefits down the road, which is combining small cores to enable a more complex, powerful core. You start with a small core design, but you add enough blue logic such that uh, you can actually form a large core when, when it's needed. This, is, this has been the dream of many people. It's not that easy to do. Uh, if you're interested, there are a bunch of articles. Core Fusion is one. It's in ISCA 2007. And there's Morph Core. It's in Micro in 2012. And these are the two major works uh, in the area. There are a bunch of other works also, but these are the two major ones. How you do that is not that easy, actually. But if you can do it, then you can achieve dynamic heterogeneity and you don't need to uh, live with static. Maybe the, the question is, is there a third, fourth, or fifth approach? I don't know, but this is part of the research uh, that may need to be done. Okay. I think I'm not going to cover the rest of the slides, but this is essentially what I said earlier. Uh, this is the paper uh, that I mentioned, be getting the best of latency and throughput, and this is the next paper that builds on that. That basically said you have a fixed power budget, and you can play with your power budget in two ways. Power budget is energy per instructions times instructions per second. If you need to execute a lot of instructions per second in the parallel portion of the code, reduce your energy per instruction somehow. If you need to execute few instructions per second, if you're in the serial portion of the code, you can increase your energy per instruction. Now, how do you play with your energy per instruction? Instructions per second, the requirement may be given to you by the program, serial versus parallel, but you can also play with it. Assume that this is fixed based on the portion of the code, you can play with your energy per instruction. Uh, so this is the basic idea of accelerating critical, uh, not critical sections, the serial part of the program. And how do you play with your energy per instruction is in this paper that we've discussed. You could do voltage and frequency scaling, asymmetric cores, variable size cores, speculation control. And these give you a different EPI, energy per instruction ranges. So here you see 1 to 4, for example. Asymmetric cores 1 to 6. Uh, and there is also a time to alter the energy per instruction, meaning switching between how, uh, different energy per instruction states. If you actually need to change the voltage, it takes a long time, as you can see. If you need to migrate, uh, from one core to another core, it takes less time. If you need to turn off some structures in the core, it takes less time. If you need to do speculation control, which means that don't fetch more instructions into the pipeline, it's even less. So time to alter the EPI is somewhat inversely proportional with the range of EPI energy per instruction that you can get. And then there is a different action. So I would recommend this paper also if you're interested. And this is an ICCD paper. It's nice, it's written, it's a short paper, basically. Okay, I'm gonna leave you with these slides. I'm not gonna talk about these since we're already out of time. Any burning questions? Okay, now we're done with heterogeneity. So we can have a good weekend. <laughs> okay, have a good weekend. I'll see you next week.